from college kids who just want to mess around on YouTube uh-huh. into the last five years where we really pivoted into like, let's make this work. Okay. And then like the last three years of COVID where we, everyone went into survival mode mm. and the last two years, one year of really sorting and like streamlining everything. Like I think if we brought the hustle that we did in the last one year, okay. Um, at the start of this journey, we will be very different right now. <laughs> um, but again, it's it's the it's the marathon, right? It's the marathon. Um, definitely, one thing for the creative industry, yeah, which is very hard. Um, no matter how good a creative you are, if you're not a good business person, your business is gonna fail. Oh, absolutely, right? man. Yeah, you you don't know how to sell your product. You don't know how to market your product in this climate these days. It's not enough being talented, lah. Yeah. You you need a sales team, right? Or you need you need to be able to sell your 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 talent. Before we begin the podcast, have you gotten your free ebook? It's called the Build a Six Figure Portfolio Guidebook. Now, inside it, we share with you the tips and tricks to bring your stock investing skills to the next level. The best part, it's only 10 pages long and it's totally free. Whether you're on Spotify or YouTube, the link to download is in the description or you can go to www.firl.co slash f-r-e-e or www.firl.co slash free. All right, everyone. Welcome back to Fire Podcast. We've had a long break, John. Right, uh, yeah. a couple of days Chinese, a couple of weeks actually. Con- considered a long, long break by, right? by our standards, <laughs> yeah. I know, I know, non like business guys, they have one month. Uh, sometimes they have much longer breaks. Yeah, but we're still working in between. But yeah. look, enough about us. Today, you know, we always introduce uh, our guests as special guests, and they're all very special. But today is not just uh, special. Today, for me specifically, is a dream. <laughs> it's a dream come true. Actually, okay. <laughs> it's a dream come true because uh, finally we get to watch, or get to talk to one of the essentially OGs, right, of YouTube, mm-hmm. and uh, the people who took the leap and took the risk to be in what today is a very booming industry. That's right. They went into the industry when it wasn't. When the it pioneers. Was, uh, yeah, the pioneers and when it was uh, still Wild West. In some ways, it's still the Wild West, mm. but at least there's a lot more money in it right now. Correct. So yeah, welcome to the pod, uh, Ming Khan from The Ming Thing. Hey guys, uh, thank, thanks for having me. And I, I, I love how you you put the Wild West. It is. It has not changed. It has <laughs> it's become even crazier, but yeah, good to be with you guys. Uh, I actually think I watched a couple of your episodes online. So huh. yeah. Which, which yeah, one do you I manage to catch? Um, if I'm not wrong, I think my friends also were sharing some of your stuff because I'm super into, I mean, I got into a lot of more uh, proactive uh, in financial stuff, right? In COVID. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm definitely sure. Uh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't all these like really colorful thumbnails yet. It was, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it, our it was back at the, yeah, yeah. It was like, ah, the black color studio. Correct, correct. Okay. <laughs> yes. was, it was someone and, and someone was sharing a clips or something a bit on, on their, on their Instagram. But I definitely remember both your faces in this black, <laughs> really nice padded studio somewhere. That's so, right. Yeah. That's yes, right. yes. Yeah. That was our old studio. Yeah. So anyway, thanks mm. for coming on. And look, yeah. I think we, you know, I think, I've watched, you've at least had three to four podcasts with um, other hosts where they go into uh, a lot about your journey and we want to go into your journey, but I think today's podcast is going to be like a lot, of, a lot of it is going to be about, about money, right? So I think I want to start off by asking mm-hmm. when you were growing up, what was your first impressions and what was your, essentially your money beliefs? How, how were you raised and then how do you um, and yeah, maybe we'll start there when you were maybe primary school, secondary school. Wow. Well, l- to be to be honest, uh, when I was growing up, like primary school, my parents really didn't have a lot of money. Mm-hmm. But one thing I really admire about them and what I, I pursue, I, I really just uh, dream to be is no matter what, right? I mean, I grew up through the 1998 recession. It was in 1997, 98, yeah. Um, they never made me feel like we were poor mm. like, or, or lacking at anything. And I think because um, my mom instilled in me a very big savings habit since I was a kid. Uh, you know, I was the kind that if I got one buck, I'd save 80 cents, you know, if I could. 
So uh, I I'm a big advocate. Of last time, like if my mom gave me food from home, I won't buy anything. Uh, I'd save. I only get like fifty cents a week, guys. That's my primary school. Uh, allowance. So when I heard my friends get what you get one dollar a day, yeah. wow, <laughs> must be great, man. Like yeah. that's success as a primary school kid, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think yeah, since young I've I think because of that, and I I really just love uh pl- that playing. I didn't really like toys or, or or stuff. Um, I didn't really develop any materialistic habits. <laughs> so, and and I was a very like happy go lucky young kid, right? Like if I have. A shirt to wear, I'm good. I got pants to wear, I'm good. Right. Uh, and, and I think because of all that, I kind of just had a very strong um, financial foundation as a kid. I didn't know it back then, but savings was a very big part of younger me. Mm. And that kind of rolled into, you know, whatever it is today. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, but, but that's that's the OG story. Great. <laughs> yeah. um, were you, if you don't mind me asking, were you sure. in a way envious of kids that had a little bit more. And yeah, yeah. Did the it, ones that was it, getting one bar yeah. and two bucks. Did it oh yeah, of did course, it as a kid, yeah. 100%, dude. Like, <laughs> dude, they can buy Kropo every day. We. I was like, oh. wow. And then, you know, the kid, right, who buy Kropo in canteen time, after yeah. school still can buy ice cream, you know. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Wow, yes. this pops, guy. Right, that. Yeah. <laughs> Not just pet pedal pop considered okay already. This guy can buy the one fifty Magnum and Cornetto oh, all. I'm yeah. like, wow, oh, you the rolling in. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. So like for us, we just looking looking and like hey, give me a bike, lah, bro. <laughs> that's, that's that's all I got. Um, but envious as a kid, I I did feel like wow, it must be nice. But I yeah. never felt like oh, I really want that. I, I was cool. I'm fine. Yeah. Wait. Wow. Wait. So then, like when you go into like secondary school, I think that's where a lot more options start to come out, right? Then, you know, mm, that's mm. when people start having maybe, I don't know, girlfriends or- Nike going sneakers. To, yeah, sneakers, <laughs> going to mm. Cyber Cafe and all that. Did, did anything change there? What what was your big learning lesson when it comes to money in your secondary school? Teenage I think my parents played it very good with me. Like they gave me nothing. So I had no wow. ones at all. <laughs> 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 uh, like I, I even in secondary school, I think my allowance was $1 a day. And this is- progressively six years, you know, uh, six years after primary school. So I'm not going to dox my age, but this was quite a while ago. Mm, And uh, one buck a day could get you something, but Mm -hmm. it's also on the brink of like, you can save it to get something better. Understood. Um, yeah, so my, my mom was an accountant by training, so she's a bit oh. smart. Oh. Uh, <laughs> okay. and, 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 and because of that, right, I, I guess it also depended on the people that I mixed with. Mm. Um, I, I mix with my my gang is the gang the pants is until your nipples one lah you know uh, uh, you pull out your pants and you here you know yeah, the, yeah. the hair is, I mean my hair hasn't <laughs> changed it's still, literally still like that right yeah. um, we never went to cyber cafes um, okay okay dating I'm let's just be honest I was not a ladies guy at all uh-huh. and <laughs> girls weren't my thing at all uh, not that I didn't want I had no choice okay <laughs> so. Um, uh, like dating and stuff like that, I had to be very smart. Uh, it, it was never really about buying presents. Uh, I never really went out. Like even going to the shopping mall was considered like, oh, big deal. Go with friends, right? And and my parents were nice. Like, if I did go with my friends and like I tell my mom, we're going to go for a movie or bowling, then my mom would be nice enough to like give me an extra bit. But um, yeah, in essence, I still was in that era where people don't really flex Nike shoes or ah. like, mm. like uh, you know, Supreme wasn't even a thing, right? At most, it was like a Rip Curl uh, oh, yeah. pencil Billabong, box. You know? <laughs> yeah, and Billabong, you know, <laughs> like that's it, dude. Like, yeah. and I never really liked those brands. So <laughs> I guess, yeah, um, I, I it, it helped la, that I think I grew up in a very well-grounded school and neighborhood in that time as well, mm, right. um, where we had like, one or two extremely rich friends and they were very nice. Yeah. So yeah. everyone was kind of like the same. Yeah. That's good, man. Yeah. But do, mm. do you like start um, doing, because I know I have, I have a lot of friends as well, not me definitely back in the day, but doing high school, they already started doing side jobs and even internships and all oh. that. Was that what you were doing oh. or no, you were just just chilling? Any side I hustles? I remember my first, <laughs> yeah, my first side hustle was I got kind of good at origami and I started making things for people oh. and I sold them mm. uh, in school. But it fizzled out along the way. And my first job was uh, in McDonald's for Hari Raya um, because they paid like triple. Wow. The, oh, during the, the public holidays, right? Seasons. Yeah. 
And I, I was in British India first, then I went to pub, like I, I skipped to McDonald's. Um, and that was it. My, my parents weren't really like, oh, Minghan, you don't have to go and work, but if you want to try it out, go, go and try. But I never, guys, I'm like the most antithesis to a hustler. I'm a lazy ass kid. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I am. I'm so lazy. Like, mm-hmm. I just love enjoying life. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, in terms of, like, all this, like, you know, did you do something on the side? Did you have a hobby you turned into, like, uh, a, a, an income? Mm. Did you want to an entrepreneur? I'm like, bro, if I could go on the internet 20 minutes a week, I'm happy, dude. <laughs> and that's that's me. I, mm. I did not you know, have any, um, I mean, what, what people call side hustles. Like as right. a kid, I just love being a kid. That's it. Yeah. Right. Um, did you, um, was there a passion for, because I noticed the guitar in the background. Did you have a passion oh. for music ever since? Was it something that was brought onto you by your parents? Or was it something that, hey, uh, mom, I want to play the musical instrument? Because, you know, I'm pretty sure you, with your kids nowadays, right? You know, you try, you try to like, hey, you have to go piano lessons. Hey, you have to go for this. Was it something that you picked up and you wanted on your own? Or was it oh. at a parent's urging? A uh, Chinese kid in a Chinese household in KL and PJ, 100% it was piano lessons, dude. Uh, <laughs> <That's> like, <laughs> it's not changed. It's yeah. not changed, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think I think the guitar was self-initiated. It's a whole different story. Okay. But piano was a thing. Um. And I enjoyed theory and piano, but I think, you know, like a lot of Chinese young kids, uh, the piano tuition lessons really kill the love for piano. Oh, yeah, man. It's oh, just, man. yeah, it's like so early in the morning or it's like after school and you just want to sleep or yeah. like go home, right? Um, but the guitar on the side, like I love music. I still do. I actually thought I wanted to become a musician. Mm. Um, in, 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 at, if anything I had to do with the creative industry, I thought it would be that. Mm-hmm. Uh, guitar was a different thing. Guitar was like, um, I was in a church that time and the, I got really close to the college kids because I was one of the oldest kids, right? I see. And I remember I had a friend, her name was Annie. Mm-hmm. And she was a college girl. And she said, Ming, go and learn the guitar. You won't regret it. <laughs> I'm okay. like, uh. primary school kid, secondary school, listening to a college girl. I'm like, why? Oh, trust me. Take it from me, you will never regret it. Okay. And that's, I just mm. I just went and learned the guitar, and true enough, she was right. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but but I I I guess that that was it lah. And, and and let's be honest, at that time, don't talk about earning money from music. There was absolutely no way. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. It's it's a it's a love for it, and that's it. Yeah. That's right. Because we were speaking to Casey Lau, and you know he's a he's actually an accomplished pianist. He's actually oh, one of okay, the OG okay. for bloggers, for financial blogging as well. And yeah, he was from that blogging era, 2007. Yeah, 2007. Ah, Casey Lau, our yeah. predecessors. The yeah. predecessors of the vlog. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so he ironically, he was quite talented. He was performing in uh, even the Hyatt Hotel in, in JB, but it wasn't earning him much. Lah. So that's yeah. why, I, yeah, yeah. I was trying to link that to another leading question, which is mm. why, why, why you chose the career of production? And oh, why wow. not the typical Chinese? I, I think there's one more gap in that story that yeah. I, 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 yeah. I was just about to go there. So yeah. I have some context mm. for John because yeah. he, he um, only until recently he was watching your stuff because I've been watching it since uh, essentially uh, college, right? Mm. So mm. I know that your your YouTube career, you can call it that, and your uni days coincided. They were they, yeah. they were concealed in the same. And I know you did psych, right? So Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so... I mean, to put it simply, I, I think people who go into psych are not there for the money, right? And, uh, <laughs> nope. <laughs> so, so They're I, there to spend money, yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? So money, what yeah. I, I can tell already that you're not someone who, I would say that uh, everything is about money and everything is about making the profits and all that. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. what got you into psych and then maybe explain to us that transition mm. into right. YouTube, essentially. Yeah, right. So funny story is I never want I I never considered psychology. Oops, sorry. Let me just get yeah. that back in focus. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so funny story is I never really ever thought I'd be in psychology. Mm. Um, my whole life as a Chinese firstborn child. What is psychology? With a father who yeah who's a father. Did they, did well, he father say, who's oh, an engineer. You're, okay. you're like, you're got fever, problem. Like, why want to do psychology, right? You know, you got fever. Uh, exactly, right? right? <laughs> exactly. Like, like it's a, it's the, the head doctor, you know, you something yeah. wrong, go to the <laughs> yeah. doctor, right? So I actually was um, uh, raised to become an architect. 
Uh, ah. So I did a science stream. I got really good in ad math, uh, math, physics, everything you can think about equipped for ar- architect. La, and I was fine. My grades are okay. Um, then I went into one semester of architecture and I told my dad, yep, this is not it. Ah. Uh, I, I never felt hatred and loathing for something that I did before in my life until I went into architecture. Because I'm a <laughs> wow. very e- easy-go-lucky guy. I, yeah. you, I'll put me anywhere. Put me in the zoo. I'll take care of animals for you. There's no <laughs> problem, right? Um, but when I went into architecture, I saw, and this was the, oh, the, the eye-opening part. Um, I had a friend. Her name is Carol. And she became one of the best architects. In, in She still is. I mean, some of these guys, like they're making waves in Southeast Asia now, right? Mm-hmm. Because apparently... Um, uh, Taylor's architecture course produces some of the best architects in our region because it's in, it's so intense. I remember the day that uh, I was our we were all assigned half an A4 people uh, paper which is an A5 to draw something and I finished mine in thirty minutes because I just wanted to get it over and done with. <laughs> just doodling, and she uh. took a whole day wow. to draw the KL station, the KL train station with dots, and she was dotting. Dotting, oh dotting, God. dotting, Whoa. dotting, and it became the KL station. And I'm like, yeah, you have passion for this. I know what passion looks like now, and that's not <laughs> what I have. Um, fast forward, my dad actually, I think as a Chinese dad, I really respect the guy because he actually said, you know what? What do you want to do? Because mm. I, I wasn't going anywhere with architecture, I can tell you. That. I was losing hair at, at uh, 20. Wow. Um, because it was just so strenuous. I He had a friend who was the dean of psychology, and the rest is history, though. I see. Uh, the dean gave me a book to read. I found that I was so interested in the dynamics of people. Mm. And I just, and, and, and I grew up in a Christian home. So my dad and mom were very like there for people, you know, to help and, and talk to people. So it kind of made sense. I found that I went into it. I looked forward to every single class except statistics. <laughs> and then um, I, before I knew it, I, I was doing the degree and I finished with an honors and I was about to do uh, my master's because... I think my thesis was an interesting one and and it had, it allowed me a chance to, you know, continue just pursuing what I wanted to do. And then, then that's where, you know, everything kind of happened. Um, when Google uh, came and established a presence in Southeast Asia and I was doing my thesis here and uh, I made a vlog that kind of just started the whole thing mm. in, in my thesis here. I see. So yeah, definitely not a side hustle, definitely not a hobby. Uh, it just came out of a moment of like, I'm really bored writing my thesis. I need to do something else. Mm. That was, that was that the was moment. It. Uh. Yeah. Nice. I, I really have one of the worst origin stories. That's why I love going to colleges and really telling people like, yeah, sure, passion, sure, sure, inspiration. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, yeah. So that, that's really it. I, I found myself in a degree I never planned for. And I think the whole theme of like, if it if it's there, let's just try it out and do it. And if it works, it works. And that's that's how I got started in YouTube, pretty much, yeah. Understood. Um, mm. What were the early days like? What was the... Oh. Yeah, what was the early days? I mean, this, this, this described, was there like... Uh, wow. How, how would you view a successful mm. YouTuber? Was there even a metrics or how, what was your benchmark? Or we, we, for our listeners, we're going to do some time traveling right now. Yeah, man. Oh my God, <laughs> benchmark? Yeah. There were no benches, dude. <laughs> um, I, I, I used to use this um, metaphor uh, when, when we did like career talks, right? Uh-huh. If I asked you guys, there's a job application to be a unicorn keeper in Zunagara. Do you want to apply for it? <laughs> okay that's an interesting like, analogy like people be like what yeah. unicorns aren't real bro yeah, you know? yeah. like no no there's a, there's a job application you go and take care of the unicorn that's in, in Zunagara and that's the closest metaphor I have to to becoming a YouTuber in, mm, in, mm. In, in the early days because the job didn't exist understood <laughs> like, like, like what do I tell my parents you know yeah, like, yeah. like do I want to, I want to pursue this yeah. the AdSense money was crap there was okay. literally nothing in our region okay um People didn't know what this space was because we were just transitioning into, uh, if I'm not wrong, we were transitioning from dial-up into streamix and then streamix into oh, yes. broadband oh, and whatever yeah. it was, right? Five-minute video, you need to buffer yeah. for like 10, 20 minutes. Exactly, yeah. like yeah. the teeny yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> so the early days was less of Wild West and more of like just landing on an absolutely new planet. Mm. You know, it's not. it was not like barren and everything. There was stuff there, but... It was uncharted. La. It was just a question mark. And people 
kind of forget this, you know. Mm. Everyone wants to be like you know, you guys said like the the spearhead or like the the, the early the get you Upon know years, in the yeah. project early, yeah. right? Everyone wants to be the first, but they they soon realize that when you're the first, it usually looks like a bad choice, mm. and and there's like no guidance, you know. Yeah. So, um, it was very exciting to me because I did not see it as um, fear. I saw it as like, yo, I can do whatever I want on this job because mm. there's no guidelines, mm, mm. and I'm gonna do what I want and feel is great, and let's see how it goes. Understood. And and very fortunate enough for me, people kind of liked what I did and started watching and sharing and Facebook was blowing up and it helped us blow up. And before you know it, I was like telling my mom, yo mom, I think I, give me one year uh, to not do masters. And then by the end of that year, I still need to come back to you and ask for, for allowance. I'll just do whatever you want for the rest of my life. <laughs> and my, wow. my parents were damn happy to hear that, man, seriously. Okay. So that's the hack, right? That's the hack. Like, like um, Always give yourself a deadline, yeah, and then tell your parents, "I'll dedicate my life to you as a slave if it doesn't work out." You know, <laughs> serve so, your hand and feet, do nails or whatever. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm anything they wanted to do, I I couldn't be personal home chef or so for all I get. Um, but it was it was a it was a good thing because with that year in mind, I I hunkered down on it and I met a lot of passionate people. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was just the right place, right time. And things just worked. And I'm so glad that that year hasn't ended for me. Mm. So, uh, yeah, that's it. And it became the world as we know it today. Um, yeah. Girls snapping pictures at cafes, uploading on Instagram, uh, creators fighting your brands every single day, selling, <laughs> telling them all hard sell stuff, you know. Uh, yeah, guys, we planted the seeds for this random <laughs> random place <laughs> in Malaysia. Yeah. Yeah. It was so, cool. It was cool. It I, was I have cool. a couple of questions. Uh, Go for it, uh, yeah. The first one is, you know, in the US right now, and I'm, I'm sure, it, I don't know whether it's the same in Malaysia because we don't collect this sort of, this sort of stats, unfortunately, mm. but people were asking kids now, like, hey, do you want to be an astronaut or YouTuber, right? Mm. Um, what shocked me was actually today, I think 70% of the respondents say mm. YouTuber. Yeah. So... Yeah. <laughs> What do you do? You think that's a do you think that's a good thing? Do you think like and if and if a kid were to want to become a YouTuber, what would you say to him or her? Oh boy, yeah, that that hit that hits home, man. Because my kid uh, <laughs> is growing up with all these kind of things. Um, but I, I I think in in the bigger context uh, of society, right? Yes, kids look up kids look up to role models that the media puts forward like the astronaut era was during the world of like you know uh, Armstrong where he he yeah. conquered the moon and he was like the forefront of like what is cool so kids wanted to be astronauts and then um, when Power Rangers came out kids wanted to be the Power Rangers and uh, when Ultraman was there likewise and I think like these days the forefront of everything that's a role model is uh, anything on the screen uh, yep. YouTube TikTok so I, I think it is between um, obvious reason that kids want to be content creators because it's all they see. Uh, my kid loves imitating um, unboxing videos and mm. uh, playing your toys because that's what kids on YouTube do majority of the time, right? Um, so yeah, we do aim to be, as a kid, an impressionable young kid. Whatever we think is really cool that we see and and. and to be very honest, YouTube is really cool. You see a lot of people yeah. at the peak. I mean, if they reached your screen, they've done something right 100%. at the peak of their passion and skills. And it just gives kids so much empowerment to say that you can do what you love, record it and make it a job, you know, one day. That option didn't exist during our, my, my era, my like, even our parents' era, right? So... I, I would say that what would happen is less of just a broad understanding of what a YouTuber is. It's more of like what content you're going to be making. Mm. And that's what we're preparing for as well. For the next few generations, it's already happening, right? So yeah, I'm not surprised because who wants to be an astronaut? Like everyone says, it's Elon. Elon's an astronaut. We are cool. Uh, unless Elon does something freaking amazing with robots, then everyone's going to want to become Elon Musk, yeah. right? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely fine. We're getting old uncle stage already, so you know, getting complaining about these young kids want to be on YouTubers again. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that that's it's 
it's expected lah. it's expected yeah so one thing that i think a lot of people wanting to come to youtube uh, look i mean some of them are also because maybe the fame or like the yeah, coolness yeah. of it but a big chunk is the amount of money so <laughs> you know in the early days right uh you know when you said you know mama give me a year and then if i fail mm. uh i'll come back right so what yeah does failure mean right because to, to me is it uh or my question would be is it if you don't earn enough money or you don't get enough traction and also maybe give her a sense of in the early days what what was, what was making money yeah, like yeah. YouTube? how much yeah, do you actually yeah. make you know let's just be honest youtube pays you nothing yes. like in the early days right uh don't talk about like understanding ad sense and ad rates at that point no one had an understanding of yeah. what it was cpm right? no one, also yeah, out yeah. the dream correct right? no, one, <laughs> no one knew what it means what is cpm yeah. like when i started when i started youtube the word kol didn't even exist yeah. you know so um I, I think i had a very simple definition of it like if i could not make ends meet in one year uh-huh. like i i stopped taking an allowance from my mom for some like for example right if i had to continue asking her like hey Mom, you know what? I can't. I can't. I, I can't afford things for myself. I can't feed myself properly. That is not success. Mm. Uh, it's not about the views because sometimes you can go, you can blow up and be viral and yeah. uh, whatnot, right? But there's there's no ends to it. Like there's no income financially. Um, it does not matter. No matter how famous you get, and you can't monetize it as a living. Uh, I mean, some people have the opportunity to just become famous and enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, not me though. So I, I, it was a very strict rule. I just said, okay, no allowance. One year, if at the end of this year, I need to return home and still ask that you take care of my livelihood, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I'm out because it just doesn't make sense, right? Um, so I'm, I'm glad that it did not get to that point. In terms of earning, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, in the English, the English division in Malaysia in Southeast Ooh. Asia. Ooh. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm joined. My camera's like bugging out, right? Yeah. Um, so being an English content creator in, Ooh. <laughs> for everyone listening and not like, listening in and not uh, watching worry, the video, uh, my some of them listen weird. on Spotify, so it's fine. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, being being an English content creator in Malaysia, uh, your a niche you're a minority of the that's minority right. yeah you're not just a chanese content creator you're bana- already bana- minority b- banana you're yeah you're a banana Indian, which is the yeah. minority of the minority yeah. right so in terms of adsense no not at all i know my chanese counterparts like my chanese Ooh, are making yeah. peers make a lot of money because their content can go to like hong kong and and, and circulate you know among yeah. the chinese speaking industry but in malaysia not so much um I would honestly say on a great month, you'd make like 3,000 ringgit. Like oh. this is peak. Lah. Like you need millions of views and the right <laughs> spots, right? Wow. So uh, I'm just being completely honest with like ad revenue at, yeah. at that time. At, so so this is like peaking towards 2014-ish. The bulk of what money you actually make is the brand deals, ah. which is which was quite a, a dilemma because people don't like hard sell, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So at that time, brands did not know how to work with content creators at all. It mm, was horrible. Mm, mm. I think I, 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 it's a miracle that Brian, my partner, is yeah. still with me because I rejected like nine jobs out of 10 every <laughs> damn time because yeah. it just like, if I made this job, I look like an advertisement and I don't want to look <laughs> like an advertisement, right? So we were very picky with jobs. Mm. Uh, Jin, on the other hand, because of his connections, it was very different working for him. Like, how things worked for him. Mm-hmm. So he got approached by different brands. I got approached by different brands. Uh, we talked about it. And we looked back on the days. Like th- and, and it just worked that way. For both of us, you would hope that you get a really good job that comes in. Mm. And because the team was so small at that point, a job can sustain you for like half a year. I right? see. Wow. And in that half a year, we cranked out original content. Mm. So we just banked in on like one big job coming in. And then we use the time and sustainability to make things that we loved. And then another job will come in and then we take it. So it was not really like a hustle to continue, you know, um, making money, which in, in hindsight, I wish, you know, uh, there are things I wish I did differently, but I have no regrets at all. Mm. We weren't chasing the bling. We weren't chasing like, let's get every single job down right now. We were really just a bunch of friends loving what we made. And that was it. 
Of course, the model has changed from time to time. Today, it's a completely different model because we have like 20 miles to feed. <laughs> so yeah. it's like a bit different. Um, but that is how, in essence, you would earn money as a YouTuber uh, when it started uh, because there was no social postings or whatnot. It was job, get the job done, get paid. And that's it. How, how do you hold steadfast to those those principles? Because, you know, MJ and I, we, we not mm. to say dilemma, we, we are very, very- You, you reject what, uh, nine out of 10, we reject 99 out of 100. Uh, so far, we've not taken any, oh, Actually, only one, yeah, one, uh, one uh, probably yeah, one. Exactly. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah um, I think it's, it's very tricky when it's like a starting out brand yeah. um, and you don't want to dilute your brand with ads. Um, yeah. You have to decide you are you going to do the sprint model or the marathon model right mm. because they're going to burn differently for your burn rates in your in your company um of course some people believe in just establishing a very high revenue right up front so you just take everything you can mm. uh, amass a huge bunch of resources and then hopefully have some audience who still wants to listen to you at the end of the day and <laughs> crank out good stuff right yeah yeah um there's not there's nothing wrong with that um and then on the other hand there are people like you know who says no nine out of ten yeah um and what happens is you become a very niche, like like for me, if I didn't do that, I, I guess in a certain way, I developed a reputation for really caring about content and, mm. and loving what I made mm. because I didn't simply just work with anyone who wanted to be part of the video, right. right? And even clients knew this and it's it, it didn't really start out good because you get a reputation for being like, oh, it's a really cocky YouTuber. Yeah. Or like yeah. a really oh. like stuck up, like never wants yeah. to work with it, right? Yeah. But you That's have the to take the brunt get, of right? it. Correct. You have to take the brunt of it as a, as, as, as a lead or a, uh, a team. Somehow you have to say no somewhere. And I'd rather say no to one person than say, uh, screw you to like the hundreds of thousands of subscribers that were watching, right? Mm, so mm. it is where your priorities are. And at that point, priorities weren't making money for us. Priorities was making a change in a new industry in Malaysia, mm. right? Um, so it was a bit different. And because of the size of the team and the lack of competition, it was a bit easier. I see. It was very different. We were disruptors to the industry, right? These days, I would say the dynamics are 100% different. You have to weigh your pros and cons immediately. You will have to take a hit. You will have to... This podcast is brought to you by... Uh, mm. <laughs> kind of things. Um, I, I, I guess it's up to your discretion, mm -hmm. digression, your wisdom. Lah, huh? yeah. And yeah. just being able to balance it out with original content. That's very important. Yeah. yeah. Um, to your, I, I want to peel some more on this, this kind of sponsored content because I had a, quite an animated discussion in, in a good way uh, with um, one of my clients. Uh, I haven't even told MJ this in doing Chinese New Year when I went back. Oh. Yeah, 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 about spo sponsored content, you know, about this okay. concept of sponsored content. So you mentioned that in the early days that you, um, brands don't know how to work with content creators. So oh, yeah. maybe can you give an idea what would be a good working relationship yeah. and what would be a bad working relationship in, in which like the brands mm. that you don't, you feel that you don't want to work with after yeah. any anymore. I don't need to name names, but what are qualitative yeah. or qua characteristics? Yeah, it's not on your door right now, right? Yeah, what, yeah. What's the first few questions first you ask? Yeah, to, to know that you're going to work. Red flags, things yeah. like that. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, I I think there are a lot of red flags uh, these days because now brands have gotten a lot smarter. Agencies have gotten a lot smarter, right? Mm, 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 so mm. they will be sneaky, sneaky and they put things in the terms and conditions. Yes, exactly. Right. So always have a dude on your team who knows how to read the brief and especially ah, the TNCs. Okay. Um, very important because sometimes a lot of my friends sign things not knowing what they're agreeing with. Ah. And then they are, you know, it's by, comp like they are forced to do it no matter what, right? So that's mm. like my first rule, know your black and whites. <laughs> okay. That's the first red flag. If you don't know your black and whites, you're the red flag, right? Yeah. Um, but how do you I get to that skill to know the black and white? I mean, during I your days, maybe yeah. Because of my psychology training, I just read everything. So, ah, um, so you are the that, guy. You are the stop shop, is it? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I am the one who helps. Actually, since we started, like by default, some of my friends know that. Ming, can you help me look at this contract? And then I'll sit down and just look <laughs> at it for a while. Do you charge them? Yeah. For it? No. No, you no. Charge, totally. I, no, it's my pro friends. Bono. Like, oh, okay. uh, pro bono. I, I mean, I'm gonna tell you guys, I'm really not in it for the money. Yeah, so yeah, if my friends yeah. need some help doing something. Yeah, let's just do it. Um. I, I do think the red flags would be akinning something to like, let's say if you own a restaurant, right? Okay. Um, you keep the customers in the dining area. 
if the customer starts entering the kitchen, that's a red flag, right? Okay. Um, so the, the, the same ah. flags with, with the client. Like if they start messing with the creative process, if ah. they start telling you how to make stuff. Okay, um, got it. That's a red flag. And also if, let's say, these are your customers, you know how to speak to them, and they start telling you how to speak to them, that's a red flag. Mm. Like, why are you telling me how I should caption and word my things when I know how to talk to my audience? Like, mm. I will put your USPs in, I will put your hashtag in, but you need to let me speak it in a language that my audience would like to hear. Because mm. if you come in and make me sound like one of your brochures, that's a red flag. I see. <laughs> so so these are way. the simple things, right? Um, and I had, I've had i literally had to explain to clients the same way. If you invite me to your house for dinner, would you like me going up to your mom and telling your mom how to cook? You know? <laughs> wow. I, I don't think so, right? Yeah. If you invited me to your house, how would you feel if I went into your bedroom and say like your sheets really cannot like change it? Uh, go and repaint your room because I think it's just not working for anyone. Mm. Like you got to respect the house. You got to respect that uh, we've been living in this house. It's been working out for a reason. Yeah. People love coming to this house and hanging out. Yeah. Why are you changing the house? You know? Um, and those, those are the metaphors to the red flags because these days, the red flags are in writing. It's about hard sell is always the deal. It's mm. the deal breaker, mm. right? Mm. Um, but to a certain degree, I also will say that as a creative, it is a very big skill set to maneuver these hard cells. Mm, mm. Some of the best jobs I've done are this, like, and, and the most un, un, uh, unpredictable outcomes are the hard cell ones. Like, I see. We did this job, which everyone seems to love, and I don't understand why. Um, it's called You Got Milk, and it's about my brother and me just talking about chocolate milk on a hill. Right. Okay. It, that's, it is that's unique. ridiculous. It is so hard sell, and these clients were not budging. And I looked and I looked at me. You know what? This might be the end of our career, but let's just roll with it. <laughs> they wanted us to use terms like shock, chalk, and like I drank <laughs> chocolate milk as a kid. I'm like, no, I drank Milo as a kid. <laughs> and we ran with it, and you know what? I I decided like let's just push it. Let's let's just not don't hard sell. Yeah. A freaking extreme sell sell this shit. Right. Okay. We, we held the milk in our hands the whole clip. We talked about it. We made fun of it. And it worked. Okay. And wow. we were like, okay, we cannot tell clients this is normal. We're not going to do this again. <laughs> wow. So yeah, on, 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 because I think we live in a world where people like to hear no to clients, don't hard sell this. Blah, mm. blah. But hey, the other side of the coin is I'm getting all these clients now because they're so used to influencers saying no to them. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, hey, listen to me. Let me work with your hard sell. I'll pivot it and I'll show you how to hard sell. Understood. So, but but that second part of it doesn't really come until like few years into the uh, the like few years of experience and getting some credibility at first. Understand. And I think that's where you guys are now, right? Your credibility. That's the first thing that you need to nail down. Yeah. Uh, that's the sacrifice. The nine out of ten, because once you build that credibility, which is the struggle for the first four years, Correct. suddenly everything just turns and it's like, hey, Ming Han, what do we do? And I'm mm. like, whoa, you're asking me? Yeah. Okay. Mm. I think you could do this. And then things start to change. So play the marathon. I played the marathon, you know. Uh, yeah. I, I, I didn't go for the sprints. I didn't go for the Lambos in the first year or the BMWs. Um, yeah, it's, that. that's the approach. La. That's the approach to jobs in general right understand yeah what would you say is uh some of your top tips to survive the marathon right oh my gosh uh, <laughs> how do you build that stamina you're, you're still alive so that means it, yeah, it's course, working course, <laughs> somehow yeah, somehow <laughs> top tip killer i'm pretty sure like i, I know your guys stuff you you talk a lot of amazing entrepreneurs and business people um and a lot of technical stuff right yeah um me being the psychologist my best tip is you got to have a good team. Like the people around you are insanely important. It's not about being the smartest one in the room or stupidest one in the room. Uh, it's about being in the room and committing to the room. Like you need to be there. You got to find people who commit. Mm. Um, up and down, smart or dumb, uh, cold or hot. You got to find these people who are like, put you first, then the job, mm. right? Mm. Because even like it, at the end of the day, um, we will we will go back and forth between media saying that, oh, 
being a family culture is really good. Then they'll flip it and say like, no, family culture is stupid. You've yeah. got to be a working culture. You've got to hustle because no one cares. You're here to earn money and then you give it a few more years and you go back to like, yeah. oh, but family culture really <laughs> brings you in and make, brings out the best in you, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, end of the day, it's really what matters is uh, partners, comes down to partners. Mm, um, mm. Same same vision um, in communication is like critical, right? You the minute you start misaligning with values of what you want to do with your business, uh, tough, very mm, tough. Mm, mm. Um, I think the trick is always to find passion in people because once you lose that passion in people and all you have is like passion in work, burnout can set in mm, very fast mm, mm, because mm. work doesn't keep you going. People keep you going yeah. very well, right? Uh, I've been personally obsessed with this whole burnout thing since the, the pandemic started. Obsessed meaning, uh, I'm not obsessed with getting burned out, by the way. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm obsessed understanding it, right? And uh, I mean, this was just reading and stuff. Um, the, the treatment to like surviving like or like navigating burnout, it's not rest, guys. It's people. It's mm. that passion, right? Because we worked four years to five years building the foundations of the industry mm. with no rest. Mm, mm, mm. like there was no holidays and there was absolutely no burnout and like just backtracking it why we survived is I think the 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 love of doing what we do uh, surrounded by people who love the same things mm, mm. really just keep it going and because we were also focused on content 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 if you guys are around a circle where you want this money 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 if that value is the same the survivability is going to be there yep. because you're going to be hustling for the same thing. And I'm very fortunate to say that I've, I mean, of course, there's been some really rotten ass apples, but majority of the apples around, you know, majority of the people around, um, they kept me in check, mm. kept them in check. Mm. And that's what the survivability is because uh, you're going to have creative blocks. You're going to have days where you feel like, okay, I got no new ideas, but hey, it's okay. Because there's someone else who'll pick up the slack and then it wow. keeps rolling. So, hey, um, skill set yes understandable I mean if you don't can't do your job well you don't do the job la. but <laughs> the trick I think is the team is the people behind it yeah. yeah so let's talk a little bit about the apples right some rotten some not so rotten oh um, here we go uh, <laughs> so let no, me put I've a kettle on guys no. okay <laughs> so uh, no actually I, I don't know if you noticed this is one of the few guests right where I, I, I find it hard to determine where this podcast could go because there's, yeah, so, many there's so many angles and questions. Can ask. So yeah. I'll start with the, the, the apples, right? Uh, we'll talk about the rotten sure. one later on. In so people will stay <laughs> oh. stay longer on the podcast today. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but, here we go. But no, no, no. So uh, uh, I think on the on the good ones, right? The good apples, um, I think there's mm. two layers. The first is the people at your level. These are, will be the people calling the shots at... Um, uh, the meeting out blank slate right now and all that, which mm. is your 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 brother as well as Brian. Am, am, I, am I correct? Yep. That? Three of you. Yep. So yep, three of us. that'll be one level, and then of course uh, the second level, which is your 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 wider, bigger team that you work with, maybe some of yeah, the, our leads. Yeah. Yeah, your leads and 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 all that, your editors, whatnot. So let's start yeah. with maybe the, the 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 top guys first. Like, what is it actually like working with the other two members, and why have you found them? at least I would assume, so beneficial and so helpful in terms of the marathon that you're talking about. Mm. I think because we were very fortunate to be in an era that um, that idolized efficiency. Mm. Mm. Now, stay with me. It's, it's really weird to say that, but we were in an era before everything was so analytical. And ah, no like big a, data. Like, yeah, like, yeah, like so much like know your team, you know, do this, never have two people, you know, don't work with family, you know, mm -hmm. we, we were pre, pre all this understanding I of business, I see. right? What we had was commitment and people, people really don't, um, people don't go through that because now you want to 10x everything in a certain amount of time. So you're worth a certain amount of amount. Mm. So you can go to VCs, yes. right? It's about the hustle and the speed, but we took our time mm. and we built, Again, this is maybe the psychologist in me start talking, but um, it's about resilience and, and understanding, I think most of the time. Mm -hmm. A lot of teams fall out because they hustle so hard that the the partner becomes 
uh, minor to the profit, right? Um, profit overtakes partnership. Mm. And and it, it's tough because in the creative industry, it's very, it's a big mix of everything. Mm. It's not just straightforward numbers, right? Um, why I think it works is like, I mean, why it works is a miracle. Brian and me are two opposite sides of the coins. Like we disagree with almost everything. Okay, um, spill the tea, spill the tea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. like we don't see eye to eye on a lot of reasoning and stuff. Wow. He doesn't think half, he doesn't think nine out of 10 things of that I do is funny. He doesn't laugh at anything. Oh. Um, <laughs> I don't understand his scripting and his process, but we just work together so well for some reason, right? And And we realize that it's like something works and... You don't trust the process at all, but you trust the product at the end, then that works for you, right? And we realize that he catches things I don't see, I catch things he doesn't see. Mm. And before we understand what we saw, it's just trust. It's like, you know what, dude? I trust you, you're doing on that. I'll do what I can to support and we'll run with it, right? People nowadays don't have time for this. It's, yeah. it's like, no, sorry, dude. It's not efficient. I don't think we're gelling. Um, I don't want to waste two months of my life in this. I'm not going to sort it out. I'll move on, right? Brian and I had years with each other. I always joke with everyone that Brian's my first wife. Um, <laughs> That's because a good one. like, yeah, it's it's really just understanding this dude. Um, and he ended up pivoting from being a creator and a videographer into running the gears of the company today. Mm. And I, I pivoted from just, um, I'm just focusing on product and, development, right? So Ming Yu is the other antithesis of what people in business say not to do, like never work with family, right? Mm. Um, you get things are really messy. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, working with family, especially when you're creating stuff, that that eye to eye on understanding a joke or something that works, you cannot replicate this with people who are not in your family. Mm. Not even if you're best friends sometimes, right? Mm. Um, and it's just that dedication to to working things out. Yes, it does make a lot of things complicated, especially, you know, because you bring in family issues when you're fighting, like, ah, you like this? Yeah, because last time you took this from me as a kid. Uh, kind of stupid kind of argument, <laughs> right? Wait, 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 such things happen? I was just curious. Yeah, of course. No, really? I mean, it's like, it's 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 not of not taking my toys as a kid, but <laughs> it's, it's more of like the lines between uh, work principles and personal principles are very blurry mm, mm, uh, for mm, family. Mm, mm. So... I guess that's how it works with the three of us. We've had time to see each other fail and fail a lot. But w what people usually do is you fail, change. You fail, change. You fail, change. We just committed to making it work. And we stuck with each other because uh, I don't know. It, it just didn't seem like we were hustling to make a Malaysian unicorn company or something like that, right? Um, and that's really it. That, that's just how it works with the three of us and how it keeps working. Lah. Yeah. What was the darkest much. moments, if you don't mind me Yeah, asking. between three of you. Yeah, what was the darkest moments that darkest probably took moments. longer longer to either arbitrate, mediate? Were there maybe moments where you were on the verge of quitting and things like that? Yeah. Definitely. Lah. I mean, one of uh, Rafi, who's not in the team anymore. Yeah. Um, but that was because of a life choice. Uh, he was getting married and he wanted to do a lot of changes in his life, you know, to pursue faith to pursue uh, the family and stuff like that. Um, it wasn't a dark moment, but it was a really tough moment because we never experienced like dissolving a partner before. Mm. Uh, oh, and dissolving a partner is not fun. Mm. Um, but I think in terms of that, the COVID season was obviously not dark, lah, but why wow, it was rough. It, like uh, you talk about necessity industry, not us, right? <laughs> um, so that really tested everything like, in terms of like trust. And in a very funny way, it also let go of a lot of expectations mm. of, uh, of performance. Because who is expecting you to perform like, like in under COVID season, right? You can't, are you going to stick to your KPIs? Like, let's just aim for a higher digit this year. Like, yeah, all the best, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so I don't think we had darkest because it's just an ongoing uh, journey of like, okay, this problem pops up, let's talk about it, let's work it out. That problem pops up, let's talk about it, let's work it out. You know, compared to like, oh, success, 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 success. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a really dark story mm -hmm. to tell other than the fact that 
we did lose a partner and since then it's just been three of us. Um, but no bad blood. It was just a very life chapter mm-hmm. kind of thing mm-hmm. loss. But yeah, everyone who's want to start a company, please uh, just plan for the partner dissolving some uh, is is rough, man. That, that is not dark, but it's rough. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. This, so yeah. this is like the administrative side of things. Uh, winding oh yeah, up, and the winding. profit, the, pro- the, the, the selling off of shares and all that kind of crap. Oh my gosh, that is... That's a blow to the company, man. So right. yeah, yeah. I, I want to get into like the COVID handling situation, but again, I I want to sure. talk about the apples first, right? But I do have this mm. like hypothetical. Let's say if three of you met today only and started mm. wanted to do something, you do, do you what do you think you'll be like? Do you think things? Hundred percent. We don't know anything. Hundred wow. percent. We have too many things to lose these days. I see. As a kid out of college, you got nothing to lose, mm. right? So that's why relationships work differently these days as well, right? Yeah. Like like after a certain age, I don't think now we would actually start anything together. Let's just be very honest. If we've not had the years together, for mm, example. Because mm, mm. uh, I think after a while, you get very solidified into your values and uh, some things don't budge. So as college kids growing up together, we've had the chance to solidify vo- like values together and apart and build a very strong understanding. That's why like, things go for the same, right? Like people say like, oh, you will not make the same kind of friends after college one. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. Right? So true. It it's so really true. that kind of, that kind of dynamic one. Really, really. I cannot explain it. It's just that friendship before college did not have a, a bigger chance of hidden agendas yes. of a goal. Yes. Mm. It was just friends for being friends. Like, at the most also, I want to copy your answers for exam. You yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. So, but after work, one thing that really like was a shocker to me was uh, I overheard a peer. I was like, oh, that guy's my work friend. I'm like, oh. work friend? <laughs> I just have friends. I don't have work friends. If you're my friend, you're my friend, right? <laughs> oh, how naive I was, you know? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It's it's a bit different. So if you had to say like, yeah, if you were choosing your partners in college, they would 100% be different than the partners you would choose today. 100%. I, wow. I completely agree with that. I mean, especially when... Um, you see, when, when you grow up in, into work and you start earning your own money and all that, the value sets that you practice, how you protect yourself. Whereas mm. when in college, right, is literally, your friend is a friend. He's fat, he's thin, he has whatever, mm. right? He had no mm. baggage. You had no baggage. Yeah. And because of that, you you just grew up knowing him as him. He, yeah. Person A yeah, is yeah. A and B and B. But okay. yeah, but here here comes my my question to you and see whether there's a there's a different paradigm to it. Did you see your three partners or the fourth one before he left uh, evolve from being your college friend into your business partners? Did they evolve in some way? Did they grow? And did that growth actually benefit the partnership or did it actually make it even worse? I don't wow. know. Wow. Yeah, of course. We saw each other grow into all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, from college kids who just want to mess around on YouTube. Uh-huh. into the last five years where we really pivoted into like, let's make this work. Okay. And then like the last three years of COVID where we, everyone went into survival mode mm. and the last two years, one year of really sorting and like streamlining everything. Like I think if we brought the hustle that we did in the last one year, okay. um, at the start of this journey, we will be very different right now. <laughs> um, but again, it's it's the it's the marathon, right? It's the marathon. Um, definitely, one thing for the creative industry, yeah, which is very hard. Um, no matter how good a creative you are, if you're not a good business person, your business is gonna fail. Oh, absolutely, right? man. Yeah, you you don't know how to sell your product. You don't know how to market your product in this climate these days. It's not enough being talented, lah. Yeah. You you need a sales team, right? Or you need you need to be able to sell your 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 talent. So that was the interesting thing. Um, moving forward in our dynamic. I see. Like we were kids who love making videos that had to turn into people who knew how to sell videos. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was that was definitely a growth. A lot of growth uh, in, in all kinds of ways. Uh, I see. Personal and, and both business-wise. I yeah. see. So uh, come back to MJ's question about the Apple. So at your, in a way, yeah. C, C-suite. Yes. Then your mm. C-suite minus one. So not as a leader, I guess. Yeah, right? as a leader. Because, you, you know, Few five six years ago, you obviously don't have the team you have now, both in composition oh, yeah. and size. Mm. So how has it been uh, now? You know, managing uh, like what five families essentially, right? Oh, yeah. 
every every month pay out one equivalent of a car or sedan, no? yeah. <laughs> so the 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 responsibility is definitely there because some yeah. of this team have stuck with us since the start, and we are watching them get married, planning yeah, families. Yeah, yeah. It's a crazy thing, man. Um, yeah. I think the responsible the responsibility uh, to do better is heavy. Mm. And it's you, but you carry it with pride. Like you want to make things work, you know. Um, it, it's a bit mad, lah, to be honest, because we never thought we'd make it this far. It was just for the lols at first, right? And now it's really just taking care of people and uh, new people that we have no idea who you are and how you came and where you found us from. Um, but I think it's all part and parcel of understanding how to run a long-time business that you want it to be successful and not just a hype. So... Uh, I guess it worked out because uh, I think from the start we never wanted it to be like hype. We never wanted it yeah. to be like oh, if ever you know, uh, or if one day the TMT brand and YouTube fizzles out, we all be out of a job. You know, yep. we never wanted it to be that way. Um, but it's nice. It's nice to learn and you find new motivations to keep going and to innovate what you do uh, according to people. Because obviously, when you're a college kid, everyone works twenty hours, no problem. When you got a kid and a wife, you work twenty hours and see what happened to you, lah. You know, mm. uh, you won't have a kid and wife for very long. <laughs> yeah, that's what you can. That's rightly what can so, say. also, you know. Yeah, yeah, rightly so. Life uh, changes, y- but you know, good changes. You know, because of the consistency of your brand, do you feel like when you get people to apply for any one of your companies, right? Um, do you feel that you you attract people with the same uh, values or spirit—I mm. don't know what you're gonna call it. Is that has that been your experience or or or, or not? Oh yeah, um, I think having the YouTube channel as a forefront attracts a lot of people of the same passion. So it was relatively easier per se to hire based on what you really want to do, cause of cause of the audience, right? Um, but yeah, of course, once in a while, there'll be a weird Apple or like a mm. different Apple who wants different things. Um, but hiring processes are okay. I mean, in general, they've been okay. And now we have an H- a HR who's understood the culture very well and, and, and what we need. And she hires very well as well. So, mm, okay lah. 9 out of 10 again lah. 9.5 okay la. out of 10 lah. Boleh lah tu. <laughs> 0. 0.5, 10, uh, then go on weird kaki will show up one that, uh, okay, okay, you know, you do internship, then okay, I guess we'll see you in the future sometime. Yeah. That <laughs> so, kind of thing. Yeah. So what are some of your worst, uh, like, I, I, I don't know if this is the right word, but I'm going to use it anyway. Horror stories, right? Or, Horror uh, stories. Rotten apples, sorry. Sorry, you use rotten, rotten apples. apples. Okay. Obviously, you're not going to name any of them unless you're the, yeah, you yeah. call no, them. Uh, but, actually, yeah. very interestingly, yeah. our hires have been okay. I think also because of I think we have good people in, in position of uh, assessing new hires. The Rotten Apple stories, I think, happen with the fame. It's not much of the team, uh, but the peers, right? The peers. Especially when YouTube booms, right? So you see a lot of people change. Like, it's a very weird industry. Um, but again, it applies to all industries. Mm. It's either you become too successful, too fast, mm-hmm. uh, or too famous, too fast. So that's when the good apples can potentially turn to really sour, bitter-ass apples. Uh, so yeah, definitely lost some friends, you know. Um, wow. Not, not because you want to lose them, but they change and, you know, uh, different priorities surface and you want to keep on going for that spotlight and I'm like, nah, I'll just chill and make a video whenever I feel like it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So we're not in the business of hiring rotten apples, but yeah. sometimes good apples can go bad. Understand. So yeah. Understand. Yeah. Like when you say like that these problems pop up with, with peers, is it um like suddenly they are become more money minded, more profit oriented, or is it because they like suppose they were to appear on a video and they request for more screen time? Is that what oh, yeah. I'm getting? Is that, that has exactly happened a what? Lot. Yeah. Uh, even the people that we don't usually work with when we do collaborations and stuff, there's sometimes like certain people are. But at the start, it was never about money because obviously there was no money involved. Mm-hmm. It was really about the attention. Right? Understand. Um, because, you, I mean, if you do remember the boom of YouTube in, in, in KL, yes, it was everywhere. Like even it got scary to me and my family for a while because it was not just on YouTube. It was newspaper, radio, TV, everywhere that could get a bit of YouTube, they would go and do it, right? 
And the attention was enormous. Um, truly the example of right place, right time. Yep. And, and, and some people, well, some people react to things like this differently. Mm. Like they want more of it. They want, uh, I guess, to go above and beyond, you know, like getting the best out of the situation or just falling in love with the spotlight. You know, so understood. That that's when the ugly things happen, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. Understood. Do you think in in I mean in retrospect, um, the creative industry, especially in Malaysia, and I mean being a content creator for so long, do you think it's mm. underpaying, undervalued in some? Oh way? yeah. <laughs> okay. That's just that that's the truth of the industry right <laughs> yeah, now. Let's yeah. just put it there. Yeah. Um, it is, it is a hundred percent. Uh, neglected and an abused industry. Okay. Uh, wow. People are underpaid for an insane amount of hours. Uh, agencies treat creatives like crap. Yeah. Uh, like some of them don't even stay true to their payment terms, you know. Um, and it's a it's a very weird place in Malaysia because there is no union protecting creatives. Mm, right. Mm, mm. There's no there's no. I mean, an agency can come towards you with a contract, black and white to protect their company. Yep. But the creative has no one fighting for their rights. Mm. So that's that's basically why a lot of uh a lot of there's a lot of unfairness in the in the I think in this general industry because okay. it's not just you no one protect your rights. You don't know your own rights most of the time. Is it because right? there's there's no guideline because no educating body or something. Zero. To, yeah, zero and nothing. also there's no there's no sandbox. I mean, creative yeah. industry, ma, how can you like, it's not like building codes you got, you have to pull yeah, a wire yeah, 10 yeah. meters from here. Yeah. Exactly. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like you need to gauge um, immaterial products yes. or like soft products, right? Precisely. Very, it's very tough. Um, and and the, the hardest part is definitely, I mean, if you think that people who are writing songs and making videos, if you think they're having a hard time selling their videos, they're having an even harder time understanding the legality around payments mm. and invoices. Mm. So that's another factor of our country that uh, like we're slowly getting closer to achieving, I mean, some kind of fairness for our own team, mm. but mm, 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 it's still mm. very tough. It's still, I would say reasonably the hardest thing we always struggle with. It's not the craft, it's, it's the, the structures and hierarchy in place of the traditional industry. Yeah, wow. yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm just keen to know because I, um, I, I, I come from a background where it's milestones are very e much more easily, uh, measured. And then when I yes. came into this industry, it's like it's very yeah, it's subjective. Crazy. It's very gray. Yeah. And then it's like, when you say milestones, what does it mean? Uh, you know, <laughs> like, like, like for example, there was one contract I was handling, um, uh, requesting for a video, and right. and it was saying that uh, they want to have unlimited edits, Minha. Yeah, there's, there's no way. I'll be the first one to say no. That's red flag already. <laughs> exactly. I think some of the worst was also like, uh, can you do six viral videos uh, Six us? viral videos. That's so, oh, oh, ah, that's red flag. <laughs> that is. Oh yeah, okay. Now that you're you're saying things like that, yeah, I got a lot of red flags. <laughs> <laughs> if the word viral, yeah, yeah, the word viral is in the first few sentences of your email, I'm like, yeah, I'm bi. I'm not doing, I'm not doing this. No, yeah. So, yeah, so actually this came, I'm not going to uh -huh. name, but this came from a very Reputable. established investment banker. Yeah. So, oh, oh uh, I yeah. wonder who. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's the it's a thing sorry. that the the weird part about our our the environment, our business environment in our country mm -hmm. is that we have cutting edge, um, innovative, top of the line, modern thinking teams and brands. Mm. Right next to it is the traditional old school <laughs> buy ads in newspapers kind of businesses yeah. who are actually some of the biggest businesses still around, yeah. you know? So that's a really weird um, balance that we're all like skipping back and forth into because if you want great jobs, you go to the innovative. Yeah. You want great money, you go back to the banks, yeah, right? Yeah, or the, exactly. or the, the exactly. property people, right? Yeah. So. I've just been really good at building bridges. Like I'll go back and forth all the time, you know? So <laughs> yeah, but but that's again that again part and parcel of creating credibility for yourself, mm, right? Yeah. You you need to show people at the end of the day. Um people in the new and innovative and the audience know it as your content. The banks, the property, the big tycoons know it as your portfolio. Mm. So you you need to do both. You yeah, yeah. the success comes from translating it. It's it's and making it common. Like 
if you think about it, viral videos are just videos that are easily consumable by, by everyone. Correct. Right? Yeah. Correct. You got to do the same with your business. Easily consumed by everyone. And mm. that's the real trick. So is my business viral? It will be viral if I can literally talk to anyone about it. I understand. So that's the the essence of what I've learned in YouTube, taking it out and applying it to like clients pretty much. You, you know, speaking of that, I, I still remember in one of the early podcasts, this is like when you guys were sub 10 on the uh, takeaway table, right? Wow. Um, right. You guys were mentioning something about creating content and we're going to ask you about this as well because... You guys say at one point when you were doing the comedy sketches and all the love story stuff that you all had a formula right. for what would get A clicks, B views and oh, yeah. eventually audience yeah. retention, right? Yeah. But you all ran into a problem with that because essentially as creators, it was robotic, right? You just, you knew what works. You just need to find the people and then you just slot yeah. in the script. You can more, well, maybe yeah. it just takes you a day to produce and, and that's about it. So yeah, maybe you want to share a little bit about that, that, that problem of... Um, you know what works, but the creator in you does not want to do it. And I know a lot of friends who are like that also, like they yeah. they refuse to do what works because it doesn't give them any like gratification. Yeah, I mean, the weird part about the creative industry is your ego, la. you know, your creative ego. You know, you, you want to make something different all the time, mm. right? But in business, if you're a restaurant and you're continuously changing your menu, oh, nobody's gonna come, man. <laughs> no one's yeah. gonna eat that, right? <laughs> so we we struggle in that balance of understanding that ego, and I think the COVID season flushed it out of me. Yeah. Like I had no more ego; I was just surviving. Like yeah. I want to do whatever works for the team. So I mean, um, there are, uh, there's a hundred percent. I mean, if McDonald's cracked the formula into making fast food in the food industry, which is a creative industry, which is also the same thing, right? A thousand, a thousand and one ingredients and food items put together in the consistent, constant way to make fast food, mm. right? You're going to ask the McDonald's chef if he gets bored? I don't think so, you know? <laughs> because it's it's how it's supposed to be. Yeah. And these, today, that's where the content industry is, you know? Um, you need to be able to crank out constant statistics for a lot of investors who, who might be interested in your stuff, right? Or if you want to do projections and get a loan or if you want to get, a, you know, a seeding round or something like that, right? Um, that's, that's, the, that's the really weird paradigm we're in because we still have the creatives who are like traditional and old school ah. who, who write movies and shorts and... And, and songs and scripts, right? And then you've got kids who are making three TikToks a day now and that's yeah. the speed, <laughs> yeah. right? So I, I think it's just really understanding which era you're from and what your craft is because if you want to stay relevant in content, you have to be like evolving every fra every phase of this, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, my biggest reminder to myself was the uncles who were complaining at me when I was doing YouTube. Like, what's YouTube? I had a young kid's game. I told myself right there and then, if the day I say something like that, it's time to do something different. And I caught myself saying that, yeah, TikTok is for kids. Oh, shucks, I'm saying it now. All right, <laughs> to start I'm going to, I'm going to do, I dove head first into TikTok and I understood it right away, right? Mm -mm -mm -mm. So, in, in that sense, yes, there is a golden triangle of uh, any content you want to make, right? It's, for a while on YouTube, it was like um, babies, babies, boobs, or bling or something like that. Three boobs. It's, if it's in your thumbnail, it's probably going to work. Wow. Right? For a while, people really milked the whole like having a girl with really big chest in the thumbnail and sex sells most of the time on, on content, right? So yeah. if you got this kind of thing, you got this kind of thing, your content's going to work. But as a creative, does that fulfill me? Mm. Like, am I am I writing what I am? That's where the problem starts, mm, right? I see. But then again, a lot of people just want to do that. So let them do that, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. If you got a creative ego to scratch, I think, I, 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 I don't know how many times I've had this conversation with the creative, creative friends, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 the yeah. one like, I can't pursue lah. This industry doesn't understand me lah. Why they don't <laughs> listen to my songs lah. I got so much talent, but why is this guy only doing four chords <laughs> blowing up, you know? Yeah. And then I'm like, but that's the thing, right? For what you are a three-star Michelin chef, if you can't get people to eat your food, yeah, like 
what's the use? Yeah. There's there's no use. You're a horrible, you're not a horrible chef. Yeah. You just can't make it your living. You know, go and do something else. You yes. get a three star Michelin, cook for your family, your captive audience, and then uh, go become an accountant. You know, whatever whatever floats your boat, right? Yeah. Um, the the whole problem with the creative ego is some creatives have too high an ego that they're not willing to meet the audience where mm. they are. And if you don't meet your customer, if you don't meet your viewer, and you don't go to a level where they can understand what you're trying to put out. Mm, mm, There's mm. absolutely no use of trying to strive to be the perfect craftsman of, yeah. of or whatever. Because no one's just going to take your, sh- your... Sorry, I'm, I'm always going to swear. When it's yeah, yeah, I know, no worry. one's going to take your stuff, man. Yeah. Like It's just going to be there and like, mm, that's a very nice thing. I'm never going to buy it. Yeah. Next. Yeah. You know? yeah. I think Ming Han, you touched it on it earlier in a sense that as uh, you have to run it like a business and in a business it means yes you must be creative but yes you mm. must also be a good business and yes you must have to also know what sells yes it's a combo of all these things only then yep. it takes yep. it, it's not like I'm the next Mona Lisa yeah but then your 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 critics say otherwise your content your, your yeah. content consumers everyone say, thinks they're the next Mona Lisa yeah right. yeah yeah so <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. but the best the best thing is like if if you happen to have a teammate who takes care of all of that and then yeah. you can just focus. Yeah. You know, that's like the dream. That yeah, is yeah. that's like the dream. Yeah. Um, I want to get your thoughts on sponsored sure. content because because a lot of it, a lot of what you guys derive income from is actually sponsored content. So oh, yeah. Yeah. where do you draw the line and how do you solicit? In a sense that how do you create some sort of a you attract certain brands you want to work with mm-hmm. or do you think that it is more that you have to go and uh, because let's say there are 100 brands 80 of the brands mm. you don't want to work with but then they want to work with you and then 20 mm. of the brands you want to work with but yeah. don't want to work with you and you have to go and approach what 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 maybe two parts of the question now. one is your thoughts on sponsored content and is, is it bias and secondly mm. is that should you pursue the brands that you want to work with even though they are not looking for content creators right yeah yeah sponsored content i think i mean you guys know where i stand in terms of turning things down very easily compared to like saying yes and them correct um i have a list or like at least a category system Mm. obviously there are going to be brands that just make sense right like like for me uh the best examples i can give people is uh i love let's say um, I, I'm thinking of something. I really, I love. Uh, I love my family, so I love my kid. Okay, there we go. Okay, because uh, <laughs> I don't really, like, I don't, I can't pinpoint material things, right? Um, I love my kid, and my kid has been like when she was born, she was like the highlight of my life. Um, so it just makes sense to do baby stuff because uh, to me, I'm already looking for baby stuff. Understood. Like, understood. I'm actively in that, right? Yeah. So there, th- there, there will be brands that fall into category one, which is like, this just makes sense. Even if it was hard sell, my audience doesn't care because they know I'm on that journey. I right? understand. Like there was, there was a time, right? I, I was literally looking for chairs. I told my fr- like whole audience, you guys recommend me your best office chairs because I'm working from home. My back is freaking killing me. Okay. These guys showed up. Ah. So, um, Makes sense, huh? They, it made sense. Like, so category one. Product. Yeah. Correct, correct. So category one is this this whole list of people where it's like, uh, Netflix came and want to work. Oh yeah, shit. Oh, anytime. That's yeah. like golden one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they don't pay me or so I'll do it, you know, just for the relationship, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that's category one. So okay. if you can, you can just see yourself using it on a daily ba- a day basis, it complements your brand. Mm. Do it. There's like, I do it for, um, I mean, if I love it as well, I just do it, right? Mm. And then go, if all, do you have a second category called, um, I could do it, you know? Like, um, let's say, uh, what is a random thing? Okay, I'll use the baby eggs example again, right? Okay. A milk brand approaches me. Yeah. It's not my milk brand. I don't drink it. Uh, Haley doesn't drink it. But I could do it, you mm, know? Mm, so mm, there's a consideration for that. Okay. Um, it doesn't really jeopardize anything. Um, let's say like even for me, if it's a shoe brand that, that comes, like I'm not particular about shoes, right? I could do it, you know, I don't mind doing it. Or if like, say I have a guitar at the back, right? And a drum company comes to me, I could do it, mm, you know? Mm, mm. So there are brands that don't practically fall into your life, but they're not impractical either. Understood. And they 
then the only the only thing would which would be the red flag in that in that brand of job would be the price point, uh-huh. right? So if this is not practical in my life, I'm going to spend more time making it practical, okay. right? And for the investment of my time, I need payment, mm. right? So it's a very simple, like, see, wow, it feels good after 10 years being able to objectify this, this, this few things, right? <laughs> so if, it's, if it's, it's an inconvenience to my life, but it makes sense, I can do it for a price. I That's see. That's category two. Okay. And of course, category three, which is like, this just doesn't make sense. Okay. Like, I'm not going to do it. It potentially can kill my brand, right? Like for me, just imagine a sex toy company comes to me and asks me to do <laughs> yeah. one. Or Durex or and something like that. Yeah, like no, Durex is, I, I mean, in the right circumstance, oh, yeah, I can true, do stuff like alcohol, which is mm. like, for, for a very long time was something I did never wanted to do, mm, right? Mm, mm, mm. But now more and more, like for example, that they moved into a category two because the message kept, started changing. It was not about drink to be cool, but drink responsibly and know mm, what you're drinking, mm, right? Mm, 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 mm. I can get on board those kind of things. I see. I, right. I was never a fan of like, party, party, party. This is the best brand. If you buy this at parties, you're cool, you're cool. You're kind of thing, right? Yeah, whatever. So category three is um, jeopardizing brands. Like, like that will jeopardize your brand. Mm, um, mm, mm. The only, uh, the only, only, only leeway I give for this is if the price point is insane. Okay. So if um like like alcohol brands, um tobacco brands and in Malaysia very rare, but sex related brands, they know this. That's why their budgets are insanely high. Uh, because they have a hard time buying in into understand, content. Understand. Right? So I I I still place them under category three because uh they potentially can jeopardize what you stand for. Understand. You can potentially kill your career. These are the immediate red flags for me. Okay. Um but then again, there's a special, I think there's a special leeway for a lot of these things. And that leeway is if that person on the other side is willing to compromise. Understood. Right? So if they are, and you can find a way to, to pivot a category three into category two, do it. Understood. You know? wow. um, because at the end of the day, you are making networks. You are building credibility. I want more than not, um, a flex on my portfolio would not just be, oh, Ming Han worked with Netflix and Marvel and stuff like that. That's a great flex, right? But Ming Han worked with an unworkable brand and mm. he made it work. Mm. I, like one of our successes was the Nescafe Dosi Gusto brand. Like literally coffee machine in your house in, in COVID. Mm, mm, and mm. we flipped it upside down and changed their approach and it just worked. And we went with Maxis and it worked. And I'm like, mm, 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 those mm. are the, those are the category trees, you know. And so it, there is both sides of the coins. There's always both sides of the coins. Yeah, understood. understood. Choosing the easy jobs, choosing the hard jobs, but the real flex is the hard jobs that work. Understood. That just made sense. But in terms of that, that's how I yeah. I choose. Sorry, I'm so sorry. A lot of this is so long winded. It's very no, 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 short no, 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 answers to all these things. <laughs> no, actually, you know, you know why one of the. Uh, the, the hidden agendas of this podcast <laughs> that we want to do as well is because mm. when I watch some of your other podcasts, just when you when you and sometimes your brother will be there also, just when you guys are getting into the meat of how the industry actually works, and then you know it's another topic. That's so that I, I really <laughs> want to know more. You know, so actually right, right, we are right. about to move to the next segment. But one last mm. question has to do. You, you know, you mentioned just now about price points and all that. And actually, yeah. it's about charging. Yeah, I think this is really crucial for for creative because it's, if you're a plumber, right? Like your market rate is quite clear, right? Like how much right, you charge right. and all that. If you're better, how much more you should charge? And I think with the creative industry, I think the first challenge is always to first of all, how do you go from unpaid to paid? Yeah. Because most people oh, start yeah. off unpaid. That's right. right? Then they are like your first portfolio mm-hmm. exposure, all that, all that stuff, and then only. They start. So what would you say is the point in which you say, okay, now I, I need to be paid. And then once you are paid, how do you charge people essentially? Of course, you don't have to reveal the, the secret way right. of charging for, for blank slate right, or right. whatever. But how would how would you tell an up and coming uh, content, content creator, creator right, right, know, right. to right. plan their finances and their charging revenue wow. model, let's call it. I would be rich every time I ask, get asked this question. It's no joke. Um, your starting pay, your first proposal, your first quote is definitely one of the most important ones you'll make in your life um, because it sets the standard for what you're going to be working for, right? For the mm. next one year to two years. Easy question, easy answer would be ask around. No? 
if you have not done research into the career you want to do, you're failing your first task already, right? If you want to be a photographer and you have no idea what photographers do, you can't do that. Um, I, I think people are scared to ask, uh, especially people who are in the same industry, right? Mm, mm. Um, because they're scared of oh, competition, lah. maybe it's a secret. Lah. Oh, yeah, you want to become a wedding photographer, you're scared to ask a wedding photographer, you just email, hey, I'm going to get married, can I get your quotes? Then take your quotes, lah, you know? Mm. Like, there's always a way, right? right? You want to go to the chicken rice store, I want to sell chicken rice or so, but I don't know how to sell, go to the chicken store and ask him how much is it, I buy one from you. There, you have a standard, mm. right? So, in terms of that, um, I, I think... This is this is internal, yeah, by the way. So internal means that your own gauge of your own price. I see. Um, this should never be a gauge of someone gauging your price. That's a whole different topic. Right? Like, like never get your customer to de- determine your price. All right. So um, I think there's definitely industry standards, 100%, right? For whatever you're going into, um, like you, you want to do TikTok, la, you want to post on Instagram, la, there's always industry standards. Your first task is if you don't know that and you continually don't know that, you're already failing your job. Mm -hmm. You you can't. There's no way you should be doing that. You should ask around. You can always ask around. I don't know what rates are like today, but podcasts, um, TikToks, Instagram posts, if you don't have anyone to ask around, I'd say the best way you can do a rate would be to just gauge the number of hours you work on a content mm. and then figure it out from there, mm. right? Like if, um, for example, I take a whole uh, two, two weeks and I'm talking nine to five or working on a video, I take, so five, no, I see, what am I talking about? Five, creative work seven days a week. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I take 14 times nine hours, right? Mm, mm, mm. And then, by that judgment alone, I only can make two videos a month. I have to make ends meet in a month, right? Yep. So whatever I'm doing in that month, I set a standard for myself as a newbie. I got to get paid 3000 a month. Mm. So both of my two jobs a month, I'm going to charge 1.5 as a starter. Man right? hour rates huh? in a way. Lah. Correct. And then just work backwards from there. Yeah. For, for real. Yeah. Um, in the creative industry, definitely a bit more tricky. Um, but I think, like for you guys, I think the, the question was asked, right? How do you know how to gauge your own like your own prices and, and where to go and, and whether it's right? I think if you feel like you're getting work too much for too little, that's the wrong price already, right? It should justify your urgency of finding the next job. Yeah. Mm. So the, the there's no right or wrong answer to this because I'm also the kind of person where I I am more interested in can I provide value to mm. what you are giving mm. me. Mm. Mm. Because if if anything, the experience I have is the people who always negotiate your price will never respect your price. Uh, <laughs> so the true. people who give you upfront an amazing price will never question your price. So that's really where you want to be. And again, leads back to credibility, leads back to your skill set, leads back to the value you provide at the end of the day. Yeah. How long should content be given for free in a sense that let's I just say I still give you know, content for free yeah, sorry I mean I still give content for free you know like like for example like this, this podcast I like just yeah. appear yeah, yeah, or exactly. like just do collaborations yeah. I think to your discretion because I mean heck knows uh, our Malaysian industry needs all the help we can get oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> right um, I think there's a rule uh, don't give family free stuff. I just say first, okay? Uh, <laughs> don't offer to shoot podcasts for your family. Don't offer to shoot videos for your family. That's just my one rule, okay? Wow. Just don't. You know, never offer your services for free in the family. It gets really weird really fast. <laughs> um, so it's th- actually quite funny. There's more often like, I have rules on no free instead of like, yes, free. Mm. Um, but again, if you feel like your confidence isn't up to par, especially for people who are doing wedding photography la, or uh, trying to help people do videos, right? I would say just, just give free until you are confident that you can execute something. Oh. 
pretty mm. much. Mm. Okay. Or, until, un, or until you really start starving and your stomach starts eating itself, then you better start charging. Lo. <laughs> that's, that's basically good, it, very man. Good indicators, <laughs> huh? Very good indicators. I mean, starvation is a really good, yeah, really good yeah. sign. Hunger indicator. Okay, I know yeah. I said last question, but I do have one last, last question for this go, segment. Go for it, go for it. Um, where, where is the brand going? Because one of the things that, uh, at least from my perspective, is that you know the main channel now has slowed down a lot, right? Yeah. And I, I and I do know more like you're talking about stand still, bro, not yeah, slow yeah, down. Okay, yeah, I'm yeah. just trying to, <laughs> guess, yeah, trying to guess. So yeah, uh, yeah, you know, it's it, it, it's on a standstill, and you know, and I can see the. I mean, in some cases, right? Like the podcast gets more views than the main channel when I compare some of the views. So. And then I also know you you just started uh, One Two Juice. You guys just posted a video about the card game, right? I haven't watched it yet. Uh, my mm. bad. And mm. uh, also you guys are doing Twitch streams. Uh, then you have takeaway table, head over heels and all that. So where is the brand going as far as uh, to your audience, the free content side of things? Yeah. Wow. I think... Wow, where is the brand going? It's such a Brian question to me all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because I create based on need or right, right, right. want, right? right? Sometimes it's what I need or what I want. Um, but I think it's a very interesting time to ask that because the biggest question I struggled with was making content during the pandemic. Oh, yeah. Mm, uh, mm. I saw absolutely use and no use at all making sketches. Like people are suffering. And the most I can give you is a laugh. Yeah, I, I don't want to do that, mm. you know? I, I feel like I'm taking light of a lot of uh, hard situations that people are going through. Yeah. So during the pandemic, for example, this is probably the best example I can give. We created the Dudu Roma series. Uh, was it yes, the yes. most entertaining? I don't think so. It was just something that I knew that we had. This was beyond free content, by the way. This was like almost as if we were taking on a hundred clients to make uh, videos for them, uh, right? So we devised a small formula um, that we could help local brands and use our influence to spread local brands as much as possible. Mm. Um, where was the direction of that? Help. It was just as many that we could help at one time. Mm. And that was the direction of the brand. It wasn't so much a deming thing thing, right? It was just, we have influence, we have network. Can we help someone with it? Instead of like, let's do comedy during pandemic to cheer you up this morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I find it very shallow sometimes, right? Mm. And now with things kind of like getting back to normal and then going back to 14K cases, um, I, I, I had a very interesting conversation with a viewer who stopped me during a meal and he was talking to me and I was, he was asking, like, hey, make videos again, lah, you know? Make up, please. I, I miss your YouTube videos, dude. I'm like, I miss my YouTube videos too, you know? <laughs> and... I asked him a very honest question. I was like, do you watch YouTube anymore? And he was like, actually, uh, no. Then you want me to make YouTube videos on, on YouTube for what? Like, <laughs> what am I doing? Like making a content that you don't even want to watch. Mm. And the truth of the matter is, even I watch more Netflix and Disney Plus, right? I'm on TikTok way more than YouTube, for example. Well, I guess the direction is, where is the content most uh, successful in first. Understand. Right? Because it shifted from social, like no social media to social media mm -hmm. and now it's understanding the environment first and then maybe we come back with some comedy and content. Maybe there are already plans. Maybe they have already been shoots but we'll see. It's, it's, it's more right. of uh, what's next and I feel it's just me lah. I, I feel like I've, it's very hard to make fun of stuff when like, the majority of the world is suffering in the pandemic. And so we are really focusing on the needs of the team first lah and okay, working yeah. a lot on things behind the scenes first. And the podcast is something that is very fun to do and Twitch is just something I picked up during the pandemic to keep to keep up with the cool kids lah these yeah. days, you know. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's really more of... Um, I, I'm a very purist when it comes to creating stuff lah. Where my heart is, I follow that first and then I make. Okay. That's it. Understand. So, uh, mm. sorry, that was the second last question. Another one. I, I, we, we sure. have to ask, this is really important because okay. you say your priority is the team, right? And uh, how do you guys manage the pandemic? I thought mm. that was, I think, uh, I, 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 that was one of the big questions I really wanted to ask when I was watching some of your other podcasts. It's like, how do you guys even do it? You got 20 over people and I yeah. assume none were fired? No, none. There you go. So how? Yeah. Um, we took a big bite first. Uh, 
I lost in the first three days. Wow. Um, I think we lost three years worth of contracts they were working on in three days. Wow. Three to four. Three days. Three in three. Wow. Because everyone didn't know what to do. And our friends were calling up and apologizing, by the way. It was not like a, yeah, yeah, a yeah. surprise, no more contract, right? Um, it was it was expected, lah. Just we didn't realize how bad it was. Yeah, yeah. First things first, all the directors stopped payouts. So we lived off our savings for at least half a year because there was absolutely no income. Mm. Um, and in that time was where I guess my skill set shines, lah. Because Brian would be like, well, now what? Because he's very practical, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Can't earn money, can't spend money. Uh, try to do something. Oh. <laughs> so that's basically how Brian sounds like, let's just try to do something, just shoot, you know, shoot something. But shoot what, you know? <laughs> Anything, you know? So <laughs> I think that was when I felt very free again. It felt like college uh, again in some uh, weird way because no expectations. Um, literally no mo- no money. <laughs> uh, it was like, oh, this is really like college again. And I asked myself, what content do I want to make first? I didn't even ask like what content should my team make? I, I mm. asked myself mm. first, right? And I think that's something that most CEOs or team leaders sometimes lose grasp with mm. because you, are, you build your company so big, you lose touch of the ground, right? Of the, the eyes and ears of what is really going on and, and what they need sometimes, right? Because you're always doing things on a macro level. Um, so I made micro level choices again. Mm. I realized that I was at home a lot. Mm. So why don't I pivot my content to my family vlogs? Mm. I just, cause I'm with this too every single day. And hey, I want to record my kid growing up. This is mm. a rare yeah, yeah, circumstance in my life where I'm yeah. at home as a working dad, right? Watching my kid grow. Why not make the best of it? And here's the thing. I never meant it to be monetized. I just wanted to record memories. Mana tau, my friends at Maxis called me up and I'm like, hey, Ming, we really like what you're doing. How are you still shooting videos? <laughs> and I'm like, that's the essence of YouTube. Yeah. You shoot videos at home. <laughs> Have you forgotten? <laughs> you know? And they're like, Do you, does that mean you can shoot videos at home by yourself and edit them? And I was like, that's exactly what it means. <laughs> so wow, back to they basics. Saw, yeah, they saw a solve. I'm like, hey, Ming, your videos are good. Can you do this? And I cooked up a whole ad campaign for Maxis in my ho- in my own apartment, mm. right? And then from that, from my family vlogs, I'm following and chasing my daughter everywhere. Okay. Maxis came in. Another brand saw it, and then NDG and Starbucks came in. Uh. And before we knew it, before even half a year went by, we had a new array of clients who were pushing in everything they could into this new new content. And then we were like, Mingyu, um, Mingyu doesn't do short stories and videos, right? But he realized that there is a need for agency work. And we pivoted the nature of what a traditional agency was. We changed products immediately because we realized that our strength in being in social media is we have to evolve, evolve and adapt very fast. Yep. So why couldn't our business be like that? So we changed our products. Our whole line of products totally made over. Mm. We retrained our staff. We went from a production crew to full-on content creative studio crew. Mm. Like we could do anything and everything a normal house uh, production house could do by ourselves in the pandemic, in a lockdown. Mm. And clients were like, what is happening? Mm. How are you guys cranking these things out? And true enough, more people began replicating it. And that's the best sign of success, replication, right? Mm. So we pushed for it. And my gosh, by some miracle, thank the Lord in heaven, people are like, okay, these guys, somehow they are continuing work. Go, 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 go. <laughs> and we were like, we went from absolutely nothing to like, we, how do we handle this now? Like, like it got to a point we need to remind the client, you know, hey, huh? we, we can't go out and shoot this. <laughs> we're, we're still in lockdown, you know, yeah, people are yeah. still dying. Yeah. And they were like, they were like, oh yeah, 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 that's true, that's true. <laughs> so it was that very interesting thing where maybe that is part and parcel of some industries or work these days, right? You need to evolve. Your your menu cannot be the same, yeah. especially when you're going through a human freaking pandemic, right? Mm. So I would really account that to um how we stayed afloat. Uh, it was a I mean 
it was a very hard start, but I think it it just goes to prove if you create something that you want to see, that you are passionate about, yeah, people will feel the passion around you. And the only difference is between the me then and the me back in college is when I started making my family vlogs, I had a whole ton of people who were already waiting to watch something. Mm. And so happens that some of those people are my clients. Yeah. And so happens that just that right information, just that right place and time, hey, Ming Han, if you're making videos, can you make some videos for us? Understood. And that was all it took. Understood. So do I have a formula for that? I'm probably the one of the most haywire guys you're going to have on your podcast, guys. <laughs> uh, I'm really just all about, you see somewhere to put your foot, you put it there. You see a next place, you put your foot, you put it there. And then when the whole pandemic passed, we sat down and this was the most important part of this kind of approach, right? Assess and then restrat and then structure and replicate. Mm. Structure and replicate. So that's kind of how we stayed afloat. Um, it was very sad to see a lot of our friends stop. You know, um, mm. a lot of teams went out of business. Yeah. Um, but in a really bittersweet way, that meant that it was a ton of work coming in for us when when everything opened up. Uh, and that was really how it is. But it was not without difficulties. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, guys. Like, ha- like just watching your savings deplete, having a new kid in your life. <laughs> like, you know, um, tell me about it. It man. was it was weird. <laughs> so and, this uh, is the perfect segue to the next segment, right? Yeah. Which is right, uh, fatherhood, right? right? Oh, um, right. Uh, I cannot remember. You became a dad. Before the pandemic, before the just, pandemic, just before, before the, pandemic. the pandemic, right? Something yeah, like that. yeah. And uh, how has it been, especially on like the finances side? So you know, when you start, you know, it's just uh, like you said, there's no responsibilities, and you know, you yeah. tell your mom, hey, just give me a year to sort all these things yeah, out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then when you start work, you don't really have to think about uh, making that much money. It's all about being a creator yeah. and content, content. But yeah. how has that transition uh, been for you so far? I think maybe it's just my, I don't know. I, I think I really have to say that maybe my, my outlook on life is very optimistic uh, uh, compared to a lot of peers. Mm. Um, but I took the fatherhood thing like wholeheartedly. I felt that when my daughter appeared in my life, everything made sense, you know? Like, like all my settings kind of made sense. Like I was on dad settings my whole life. I was never <laughs> oh. like boyfriend settings. That's why none of my relationships worked out. I think I'm just a boring dad. Like that is me <laughs> my, in my full 100% capability, right? Um, and and it, it was very dear because I'm also one of the KOLs, I guess KOLs. I'm also one of those people from the start of the scene that even my brother knows, my, my peers know, I've never spent money like I don't spend money. Like I don't have, uh, an a thing, right? I I just don't like buying stuff, you know, in general. So that's where the whole golden rule of savings really just mm. become the champion, right? Um, I think when it it was not that we were not prepared for a child. It, I think we're just in a good place for it to happen as well. Yeah. Um, but un, unlike what a lot of people feel that oh, I don't have a kid. It's another responsibility. You know, mm. um, like it's a very burdensome thing. I'm like, bro, our parents last time, seven kids, they don't care about money. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah, And only I, one, I want, one person working yeah, here. Right. That, I want that for my parents, you know. I want that resilience that the world lacks these days. The world is more worried than resilience, right? Yeah. And it's true. The minute, right, I tell you, I, I, do you guys have kids? I'm, I'm just oh, just being fair to ask everyone this. No, you guys have not kids. Not me. Yet? John does have a couple of kids. Yeah. Right. Couple of kids. John. Like I mean, you will see it one day. Don't, don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. The minute you hold your first child, right? Precisely. Something in you changes. One. Something will click as a guy. That <laughs> that's is the day. The same thing as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That is the day the boy in you becomes like semi man, not full man right away. But yeah. there's a difference. One, you know that. Okay. I've been playing around until now. <laughs> Cannot play it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, Minghan, I was I keep on joking with MJ. I said, uh, wait till you right. pay for diapers. Yeah. Wait till you sleep on uh, three, four hours a day. Mm. Wait till yeah. your your you go to the supermarket and uh, this is I, I, I tell MJ this, but I don't know whether he remembers as I said. The father is willing to eat ice cream potong one ringgit. 
but the daughter yeah. can have the nine ringgit Hagen Dazs uh, or the ten ringgit Hagen Dazs. And he, the, oh you know, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm pretty oh, yeah. sure you know where I'm coming from. Right? Yeah, Haley's <laughs> is like Tila Mook, and I'm on like Walls <laughs> Magnum or Walls yeah. Ice Cream. Sorry, Tila Mook. Yeah, Tila Mook. Tila Mook. You know, <laughs> she like right. dude. That's like two years old. Yeah. She's like Tila Mook. I'm like, oh, excuse you. You know, <laughs> like eat some pedal pop, dude. Yeah. Like, kind of thing, right? Um. So that's that's like the very interesting thing because I I I have I mean it's my peer group right like yeah. who are now um, have that question thrust into their faces yeah. hey when marry when yeah, kid right exactly. and you know our generation like hey parents screw you yeah. I want do me you know yeah, yeah. I I have to I have to be honest though I'm a huge advocate of if you're not ready for a kid don't 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 really if you're not in the right mindset yeah don't don't force yourself to have a kid exactly because. The kid don't didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. Don't let the kid pay for your wrong. Okay. Correct. Correct. But, but in 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 another, I mean, in red in uh, in reverse, uh, like Jordan B. Peterson, my favorite clinical psychologist, right? I think it's less of un, like it's less of like this fear, and and just staying away from the fear, but realizing that everyone has this fear. Our Le- dad had this fear. Lean Our grandpa it. had this fear. Yeah. Right. None of them knew what they were doing. Yeah. Right. Um, but they made it happen anyway. Why? Because we're human. Yeah. And as a dad, that mammalian parental instinct will kick in. Correct. And I swear, dude, I tell you category one, category two, category three drop, right? When Kaylee came into my life, I'm like, I'm going to make sure that you were one for nothing. Yeah. And the motivation to hustle actually appeared for the first time oh, in yeah. my life. Yeah. Right? Wow. So like, I wanted to make things work. I wanted to figure things out. I wanted to make sure that if any chance, by any chance, I disappear from this world, you will be fine. Yeah. So there's a very different hustle that comes in when it comes to like fatherhood for me because I really feel that up until Haley or up until I met my wife, I never really even lived for myself because... Mm. I just like having people around, yeah. right? But when Haley came into the world, I'm like, I think I can live for a few people now. Like my wife, <laughs> my my kid, my so parents when, when who are two? growing older. So when number two? Uh, <laughs> looking looking for the looking for vaccine. No, that's a very big question in my even in my family right now, yeah. right? Um, I'm I'm figure, I'm pretty sure I'll figure it out. But yeah. but there is a very different hustle when it comes to fatherhood for me, and yeah. I feel that I finally grew into my age, and mm. I, I'm loving it. I I I, I it makes sense. It makes work make sense because last time I can hang around until like 4 a.m. at night to do work. But now it like optimizes my time because I want to cut off and I want to spend time with my kid after yeah. a certain time. Yeah. Um, I, I, I am very blessed to be able to do this because I know a lot of fathers and mothers don't have that choice. Correct. They have to, to work and hustle, right? Um, but it's very different that that responsibility that comes into your lives is the best thing that can happen to your life right. because it straightens out everything else. Yeah. It leaves room for no doubt or not error. You will make errors. Yeah. It leaves less room for anxiety and wondering about will I do this or not? No, dude. You become a dad, you make it happen. Yeah. Full stop. Yeah. Right? So maybe that's a secret to life. Carrying yeah. on the DNA uh, cycle because yeah. Yeah. something just empowers you as a caretaker to someone else. Precisely. You know? Yeah. Um, and I, I will say that uh, fatherhood I think brought back a lot of stories that I can tell to I mean to YouTube if ever YouTube comes again like I've written a lot new stories that I had to stop for a while and write again right so yes does it benefit the business 100% if I didn't have a family <laughs> vlog I wouldn't be afloat right now in my studio right <laughs> it's um, crazy. Yeah. does it benefit you as a creative oh yeah definitely I've, uh, definitely um, does it benefit you as a person yeah 100% does it benefit your sleep? No, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so yeah, you are absolutely right on three and four hours. But yeah. I, I feel like the the film industry has trained me very well for lack of sleep, so I'm okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, fatherhood has been a very, very, very interesting phase of life uh, to grow into. One that I did not see myself being one of the first among my peers. I always mm. thought that I would be the last. Mm. Um, but again... If that's what life brings to you, that's what you do and you just keep going with it. So, yeah, diaper shopping any day over yeah. events. <laughs> yeah. Any day. Wow. Just For a trivia real. question. Uh. How do you explain to Haley what is your job? Oh, I think she fun. need last. Uh, oh, trust me. I thought I thought I need to explain. Yeah. I think I think kids these days don't need the explanation anymore because <laughs> they're seeing so many online. Yeah. Like literally, I think just, oh yeah, my dad's one of them. 
I really, I, my dad want me to become content creator. I just really want to become accountant. Can you please stop that? <laughs> yeah. You know, I feel like that's going to be the paradigm next time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, probably one, uh, one question I want to ask in relation to this. Um, because you've always been a savior, so it's not so much uh, or very difficult for you. But mm. do you see, maybe come from an angle of, when you look at your peers that are not ready for family and all that, uh, how much of it do you think stems from their inability to manage their own finance actually? I don't know whether you- And how much do you feel is enough for yeah, you to start? Yeah, Because right? you yeah. mentioned something earlier oh. on that you felt like uh, you and your wife were financially okay to have a kid. Yeah. 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 So what, what's that, uh, what, what does that look like actually? I think the first question is, I think the peers, the, the, the reality that uh, they got to start to face first is, what kind of life do you want to live? if you want to have a kid. Mm. Like, do you want to continue the cafe hopping life? Yeah. Uh, buying a bag every other month? <laughs> uh, do you need that every month? You know, do you need that service into your life, right? Mm. Or that privilege? Because a lot of these things are not necessity, but we grew up in the ability to to, to indulge ourselves, right? Yep. I, I, I think it's really less of, um, do we have enough? We have enough. We have more than enough. It's just that what are we willing to sacrifice now in our finance mm. to have a kid? Yeah. Kids aren't expensive. They are time intensive. Yes. You know? Yeah, it's it's like they are useless one. It's not about they need a few thousand dollars one. And unless your kid really needs a thousand dollars every month, I'm I'm not trying to be insensitive. Some yeah. kids do need medical help, need yes, special attention, yes, understood, yes, right? Yes. But rarely la, your kid gonna ask you to buy Prada for them every month, right? <laughs> um I I do think it's it's more of um uh, being in the right state of mind mm. rather than understanding uh, a financial need unless you are in a really, a truly bad financial situation, you know, where it's not stable, it's f not fixed and or it's in the red. Then of course, f as per anything like that, mm. I wouldn't recommend it, right? Um, but it, it will be more of, do both parents want to continue working to upkeep their job and their income. And career would path. It, career paths. Do this, or would the choice be one of them to stop and the other one to carry the income? That is the, that is the worst question and the tougher question to ask compared mm. to am I financially ready to be mm. very honest. Mm. Um, but I think with two working salaries, even if you were like, earning three or 4,000 each, 5,000 each, and these days a lot of people stay with their parents or they rent a place, it, it's a more of a question of um, are you willing to uh, to be responsible uh, for the unknown that's about to happen? Yeah, right? right. Because you can plan for the best and sometimes the worst happens or you can plan for the worst and then nothing happens and it's just super free and easy, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I think, again, that question also, it's crazy, right? Like, like you know, M MJ uh, or like, uh, we ask that so often compared to our parents. You think our parents ask, am I financially ready to have eight kids in my house? Uh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> but it was more of like, my, my, I remember my grandma and my grandpa was really like, work hard, do this. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, the role of a father is to, to support the family. And it was less about, can I? Mm. It was more yeah. about, I will. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think that, yes, we can all do margins and, and, uh, I need to have a certain amount of savings and yeah. stuff like that. So to be fair, how hard it was for you to plan your wedding, that's a very good stick to how hard it's going to be for you <laughs> to have a kid. I'm always going to say that first, okay? Because if you had a hard time and you overspend for your wedding, mm. the recovery period into a child, um, it, it's it's a good yard, it's a good measurement, but not exactly the same. Lah. Your kid mm. isn't going to need a down payment of 20000 or something like that, right? <laughs> um, you go to UTM or like hospital KL, you could get a delivery for very cheap and very yeah. good, uh, very good uh, necessities and amenities there. Yeah. And then just pacing it out, like a kid averagely costs around, I'm being generous, a thousand onwards a month. Yeah. Right. Can we do without a thousand a month? Yeah. I mean, sorry, I got a calculator right next to me because I just work like that. Uh, <laughs> A thousand, thousand a month is a savings of, I'm being very generous. I know people work on less. That's like 33 bucks a day. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, 
can you cut out 33 bucks of your day? I'm pretty sure. Or set sure. aside 33 bucks every day? Probably. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah, go, go on, go on, sorry. Oh no, that's it. Like that's okay, the, okay. the yardstick for me. It's, it's I think, um, I think it'll be less of a question of like, can we afford the kid? And it'll be more of a question of what are we ready to give, to give up? I think it's the right, sacrifice so is the one that's holding a lot of people back because yeah, they're so it's, used it's not to the that. Earning, yeah. Man. yeah. I mean, you think about it, right? If you want a dream car, how hard are you going to work for oh, your dream yeah, car? Oh yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. You talk yeah, about yeah. kid, the kid doesn't even cost the dream car up front. Yeah, yeah. And exactly. you're, everyone's like, oh no, I'm scared, money, money, I shut yeah. up. It's not the money. For me, it's right, an excuse. Right. It's an excuse. Okay, it's, okay. it's the reason, right? So yeah. here, here, here's one thing I, I want to introduce into this discussion, which is actually a, a education. For children, okay. because I think that's the big variable cost when it comes to, yeah. to children. So a lot of people, I think in in Malaysia as well, uh, more so in the, the the area we live in, because uh, uh, we are Clank Valley people, yeah, PJ last, yeah, yeah, PJ, yeah. Okay, PJ yeah. people, yeah. okay, They're not too happy with the the uh, education system and things like that, and so mm. they want to if they can push their kids into maybe uh, call it private schools, international schools, which places like PJ and all that. Right, we right. have a plethora of all those kinds of, right. kind of schools, right? So what are your thoughts on, on schooling? Because I know if you choose to oh, wow. bump it up to that kind of level, then that, that 1K or 2K would It would be fit, balloon right? to probably three to four times. Then minimum, it's a couple yeah. of fresh grads or yeah. maybe 1.5 yeah. fresh grads that yeah. you have to pay for. So what are your thoughts on uh, education? Obviously you're not, there yet. No, she's only, oh no, I'm already talking about it with my wife. Oh, like okay. so, yes, yeah. so please <laughs> yeah. share. Like, I mean, also maybe this is the benefit of doing psychology, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So child development, right? <laughs> <laughs> My thoughts on school uh, is really, really honestly, primary and secondary school is not about learning. Uh, it's not about academics. It's about social skills. Yeah. Mm. You are really, uh, in, in, the, in the years of this, of your life at that point, it's about you being an acceptable human being. Mm. Com- more, more so than a successful human being, right? I want my kid to learn empathy when they're young mm. because these are the things that you got no time for when you grow up. Yep. You know? wow. Or you have built a horrible foundation of empathy and you're a horrible person by the time you grow up. Right? Um, I'm not a kiasu parent. I am not going to line up in front of Chinese schools to get my kid on a waiting list to destroy their childhood of fun. Right? Like, <laughs> uh, I saw my sister. I mean, I'm yeah. so sorry to everyone who went Chinese school. Okay? I'm not being, I'm no, not trying to be horrible. I went but to I Chinese saw, school. I know what exactly. You're about. <laughs> right? It's the, it's the stress. Like oh, my yeah, Chinese school friend. It is, it is. No, the my back chi- is bigger I, than the yeah. human. So. Yeah. yeah, dude. St- everyone stunted going to Chinese school because yeah, of the yeah. weight of the back. Right? No? Yeah, yeah, but um, quite strong. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, it's, yeah, your backs have become very strong. Yeah. Like, you know? um, I, I, have a, I had a very different upbringing compared to my friends who were in Chinese school. I had oh, yeah. a very different childhood. Like I, I remember, uh, I mean, in comparison, I definitely had a lot more fun, right? Um, but I think it's your style of parenting. If you want the best for your kid, it's it's less about dumping them into a good school and like and and more about teaching them about the importance of why you need to study, oh, right? Because yeah. I feel like if your kid, like for me, I understood the importance of saving, for example, because my mom taught me about it when I was a kid, and it was less about. You don't, you don't go to your kid and put them in front of the bank. Nah, save her. You know? Yeah. <laughs> right. But that's what people expect from schools, yes. right? Yes. Oh, yes. So, yes. so um, I, I think it's more of really what you do at home. And, and, and at home, it's more of like with my, my wife. I told my wife, right? I'm really, I mean, other than the fact that if really we monitor the syllabus and it just gets horrible and more horrible, I really will send my kid to as real a school as I can. I, I need her to adjust to the real world compared to a a, a very safe, private sheltered. school. Sheltered school. And then they come out in college, but by that time, they're like shocked at everything, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think my focus on schools or my, my importance of education will be kids don't appreciate education when they're young, but they have to form certain disciplines, right? Studying, uh, getting grades and everything. Um and and if and more often than not, look at my freaking career, man. If anything, right, everyone has just proved to everyone your degree doesn't matter, lah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we end up doing stupid things anyway, right? Or we end up doing something that's completely different anyway, right? Yep. Um, I I think my take on that would be I would love to be able to send her to a good school, right? Of course. Um, depending, and the only reason for that is I want good teachers. Uh. I want teachers who can communicate education, right? Not 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 so much about like oh prestigious school let's go there you know or, or what right 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 and uh, but for that 
I have to be involved with it as a parent. Lah. I need to monitor and stuff. So I'm I'm not too fussy about primary schools or secondary schools. Um, but I will be fussy about college because I feel that that one is, I mean, looking back at my college years, friends are very important at that age as well. Um, and your the shaping of your mind to understand discipline and, and performance is very important at that year. Um, so yeah, government school, no problem. Go lah, go and uh, play in the mud, you know, have all kinds of multiracial friends, speak different languages. Uh Ponting sekolah, but at least tell me lah if you want a ponting, that kind of thing, right? <laughs> it's all about social dynamics when it yeah. comes to like a kid, you know? Our only job in the first few years of a parent is I need to make sure my kid is acceptable enough socially. Yeah. So, Not socially so they have inept. a good life. Yeah. Yeah. So they have a good life as well. Um, yeah. This is all like a Jordan B. Peterson again. Like, because yeah. if you think about it, right? I mean, paraphrasing him, if you don't prepare your kids socially, yeah. it's going to affect their life because- yes. If they become a uh, an, a very detestable or annoying kid in their formative years, they will take that and 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 form along that. And um, how because if a if you're an adult and you see a very annoying kid, your face will be like this. Yes. And can you imagine that's all the kid oh, sees? Yeah. They will become like that. Yeah. So my job is to make sure the adults around them are always like this <laughs> or like always real, right? Uh-huh. So. Yeah, that's my thought on education. We can talk about hours about all these kind yeah, of uh, that is why questions, this is, guys. Uh, but yeah, such a fun. Yeah, but I know time is running out. Yeah. So uh, anything oh, else good, on good, fatherhood? Good. Yeah, no, uh, just related to the education because I mean, yeah, Minhan yeah. and I once of course, of course. once with parents, right? You can yeah. stop non-stop lah. You education. Yeah, yeah. How you yeah, because money. all of us don't know what we are doing, so we need to share yeah, notes. Yeah, yeah. That's basically yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, but just just maybe yeah. a fun fact, and don't know whether this is a question, but more of a statement. Um. I used to be a recruiter in my career. And mm. what I found was that sad factor, because I went to a LaSalle school. So English ad, banana. Yeah. Ooh, LaSalle. Uh, mm. LaSalle. Uh, yeah, so. LaSalle, LaSalle. Yeah, so <laughs> what I found quite sadly is that um, a lot of the Chinese educated uh, graduates, uh, I would say nine out of 10 will not even have the confidence of speaking. Which I find very people sad. skills, which is like a people basic skills. thing, right? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Very basic. Yeah, and uh, they'll they'll score good grades because uh, I, so I w- I was working for a multinational, a Dutch company, and how we screen obviously the criteria is of us good grades, you know, and all that kind of thing. But the moment you put them into a, a setting where they have to work with people, they have to articulate, they have to sell their ideas, right? Yeah. We we as recruiters we had to tease it out from them, and I find yeah. that very sad. Yeah. Because. Um, if you think about life today, you know, I just, I, <laughs> MJ knows, I just shelled close to 20K in a programming class for my daughter. So she's 12. Yeah, yeah, but it's well worth it, trust me. I mean, from my point of view, like, I could be biased. Yeah, but, yeah. but here I was, I'm thinking of it. Today, as you rightly pointed out, your, your degree, your education and all that, it's not really about the school you went to, whether you did IGCSE, whether you did IB, you did KBSM, yeah, yeah. whatever, right? It's how you function, how you unlearn and how you adapt in society and how you create yeah. value on the table, you see? So yeah. maybe maybe my question would be to this. Are you bold enough to be able to allow your children to take alternative schooling if there is an option that exists? Oh, that's a beautiful question. Because <laughs> yeah. my wife was homeschooled. Ah! You see? Yeah. So I think we have a... I mean, in my family, or my small, humble little household of three of us, Yeah. We've got experiences across the table. <laughs> <laughs> so you, so, LaSalle, her homeschool? Uh, no, I'm OG D- uh, Damansara boy, dude. Like, okay. it cannot get more government school than my one. Oh, the okay. one got rival school, like, got gangster flying outside <laughs> every yeah, other day. Are you, like, are you, are you know? at Liberty to share which uh, DJ? high school? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. I, I, I grew up in Damansara Utama schools. So I went to oh, primary school, Damansara wow. Utama, and uh, I went to secondary school, Damansara Utama. SMKDU, so, okay, okay, yeah. okay. SMDU, SKDU, yeah. So I've been, I've been in DU my whole life. Okay. Um, even though I, I did not have a Daman Sarutama address, but because there was nobody in the area, I just went to those schools at first, right? Okay. Um, so I grew up in these schools yeah, that, that really taught um, uh, like normal people. Yeah. And that's the best that you want to have. Exactly. Right? My friends were like the run of the mill. Ah, bings la, aliens la, uh, kampung boys la, kampung girls la. And then like, just uh, every other normal citizen that 
we'll be walking the streets these days. Mm. We go to chicken rice for lunch. We have nasi lemak or roti janai for breakfast. Yeah. It's that kind of true one Malaysia in my eyes, lah, right? Yes, yes. Um, and my wife also grew up fine. She is a homeschooled girl. Okay. Um, also, but homeschooled then went to Nottingham, like like Newcastle University in UK. Okay. So she's had a good mix of everything. I never left. By the way, I've never left the country for education. So <laughs> same here. I I I never had the chance. I I I was born and bred and learned in in uh, KL, right? Yeah. So in terms of education, I think we do have enough kind of experiences throughout our lives to make the choice. Yeah. Alternative schooling, oh bro, if I, I if I could, I would have learned everything online. But <laughs> I know for Haley and looking at how she is, she's a people person. I see. And and I, I would put her, I would prioritize more actually the environment of people in her school compared to her learning. And, uh, and that's a very the reason good point. why be, yeah, because I mean this will go into a whole other topic, but um, education is outdated. The system is outdated. Yeah, um, we lived. We we were living in eras where we had to be fed education. Yeah, but we are in an era where everything is accessible. Yeah, like at a fing- our fingertips. So it's less about the school, and it's more about giving my kid the understanding of how to learn. Yeah, right. Because Haley is speaking four languages that I've never taught her. Okay. Do you wow. know she, she? I mean, we don't I don't share this, right? Yeah. She learned to read by herself. Wow. I I don't know how she. I honestly don't know how she did it, and that just proves to me that all I needed to teach her is, here's how you use an iPad. Yeah. Here's how you use it right, and if anything weird happens, I'm gonna be there to make sure I censor it for you. Okay. Right. So, it's really more of that, and I'm understanding this new interaction because. We grew up in the world before internet, and and now it's not the same world anymore. Mm-mm. So why is the education still the education system still the same? Mm. It should be morphing. Right. So all I'm going to train you is to have the flexibility to learn differently. Yeah. Alternative schooling, common schooling, abnormal <laughs> schooling. As long as you become a good person, school wherever you want. You know. Yeah. Uh, that I guess that's my principles on it. I'm 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 a lazy guy, guys. I told you already, right? So, uh, in the group in college, I'm the one presenting, not the one studying. So, yeah. nice. <laughs> should we segue into? Yes, investment? I think this is the final bit on the segment, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, crypto, right? Uh. This is the least <laughs> talked about aspect of uh, your your life and your public life. I remember. I think you've only had a couple of crypto streams on Twitch. I oh, yeah. I went on for oh, the yeah. first one. I, I missed the first half, if I'm not mistaken. And I know that you, it is by choice that it is quite unknown for you because you know it's in the world of finance and you don't want people to be like influenced uh, by you and then <laughs> yeah. they start buying and then they lose money and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you don't have to worry, our audience, we always tell them, you know, NFA, not financial advice. Oh, none of this is financial deal. advice, please. None yeah. of this yeah. is financial advice. So Only please, for uh, educational purposes. Only. Yes. Entertainment purposes, not even yes. education at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you lose yeah. money, it's your fault. If yeah. you make money, uh, it's your fault. Uh, it's your <laughs> job, you know? Yeah. We don't it mind is, is. some coffee, you know. Yeah. So, mm. How do you stumble into the world of crypto and maybe walk us through like mm. who introduced to you or what yeah. introduced to you and then when was the first time you bought it? What do you buy? And then uh, where, what is it today? Like how are you, like how are you operating in the community? Right. So I was there before. I was cool. I'm going to just say it first, right? Um, because it was during the COVID era as well. And you know, mm-hmm. I'm a savings guy. I'm very, I used to be very passive in my investments, right? Um, but the minute uh, COVID hit, I realized that, okay, this is not working out. Uh, f- the the first sign was the fixed deposit rates, right? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So if, you don't need to be a genius to understand that the bank's fixed deposit rates are, are not going to hedge you against inflation anymore, right? Um, and to me, that was, that was the worst because I really don't like it when my money is not working for me uh, and I'm putting it in the bank and the bank's going to be using it to do other shit and I'm not going to be able to access my money. <laughs> like, you know? So I, I'm, I'm lazy, but my laziness also feeds into like, I want the most efficient way to do something, right? That makes sense. Uh, and, yeah. That's, yeah, and that's when I really was like, I remember I was literally in bed and I, I started Googling, how do I trade the stock market? And that's how it started. Ooh. So I dove hit first into Forex, right? Ah. Uh, I lost a lot of money, guys, because that's how you learn, right? Yeah. Um, 
I, I would not advise people to do it unless you really want to lose money. Uh, what was a lot to even, you if you're at liberty you share? What was a lot to you at that time? Oh, I lost, figure, I've lost thousands. Figure? Like okay. thousands just at the start of it. Okay. Because wow. trading is tough. And oh, yeah. until today, I've gotten better at it, definitely. Uh, but there's a whole different skill set, really. It's an emotional skill set. Mm. It's a mental skill set uh, above just numbers and charts and patterns, right? So Forex was something that I really enjoyed, uh, partly because of the rush and partly because of like being able to make money no matter what, right? Mm, mm. And, and after a while, I just got very burnt out because when I go and commit into something, it's like 14 hour days, 16 hour days kind wow. of movement. I would do charts until 2 a.m. at night. I wake up at five o'clock. I watch the market open and do charts again. Wow. And then at the same time, I'll be running, I'll be trying to run and save the studio and shooting family vlogs Ooh. and editing videos. And this was my COVID years, right? So I, I saw all these things happening and I realized that I always wanted to Google something that I never had the time to Google. Mm. And I was like, how do I buy Bitcoin? And that was me, that was the start of crypto i see and i i got introduced uh I, I think i asked some friends some closer friends uh and some of them kind of already knew crypto so they teach they taught me how to set up wallets and which exchanges to use and i stumbled across across uh ethereum's chain and i, I started going around but it didn't make sense to me because it's so expensive if oh, you do yeah. not have capital <laughs> you cannot trade on ethereum right oh man it's not for the layman to trade. Yeah. Uh, even before retail was in Ethereum, my my Ethereum gas fees at the time were like twenty to fifty bucks Whoa, per transaction. Whoa, that was a good old days, man. Yeah. That was very good days already. No, but even way. at that point, it made days. no sense to me. Why would I want to be doing nothing yeah. that would put my wallet in fifty percent, like my investment before I even do an investment, right? Whoa. Yeah. So that's when I started to understand that crypto was more than just Bitcoin. It was more than just Ethereum. It was DeFi. And DeFi was the wild west of the finance world. <laughs> still <crypto>. is. <laughs> it still is. And no yeah. one should go there without proper education. Oh, just saying, oh, right? 100%. But that's where I found that I excel. I love shit coins. I love <laughs> alternate coins. I love alternate, alternate coins. I love <laughs> coins that have absolutely no meaning, right? Yeah. Um, and then I just dove hit in. I understood uh, how to set up my wallets. I understood security for wallets. I got involved in projects really early before retail. Mm. And I hung on to them. I think you might know one of the earlier ones. It's called Pancake, right? Pancake okay. Swap, um, yeah. Pancake Swap became, it overtook Uni, it overtook Sushi. It became the most used swap of DeFi uh, the past two years. I was probably one of its first 50 users. Wow. That's, that's how early I was into Pancake. And that's where I learned everything because I was so early, I got really close to the development team and they taught me so much. And I, I got to know people from Romania. It was crazy that I was sitting in my room alone and <laughs> having this life where no one knew about, right? Because yeah. it was like a, it's really like a alternate identity for me and I never shared it. This is probably the first time I'm sharing so much mm -hmm. of it. Wow. Um, Exclusive. I'm a very yeah. different person in the networks. Like people know me from Cake but under a different alias, right? So I, I, I learned the ups and downs and I realized that, wow, decentralized finance solves a lot of problems that centralized finance cannot solve. Mm. Um, but at the same time, it has a lot of problems that centralized Ooh. finance does not have. So <laughs> give and take, you know? Have you been rugged? Have you been rugged? I'm pretty sure you've been rugged before. Oh, I love rugs because you need to know how to get out of them, right? <laughs> so I have special wallets for rugs, which I know that this project sucks as hell, right? <laughs> um, but I also have friends, like we have, we have a group where we used to skip from project to project, okay. uh, but we were smart enough to read contract code. Okay. So we would know if if we bought something and you didn't let us sell it, we wouldn't be buying it, right? Uh, the craziest pump and dump I've been in was like a, an X-15 in like 10 minutes. So <laughs> you have no idea, man. Like I was like, I don't need to go Gunting anymore, dude. I can just trade DeFi <laughs> at some point, right? Um, but that's not good financial advice at all, guys. So please yeah. don't follow that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think I think in DeFi, I, I even, even in 20. 20, I was already interested in NFTs. Mm. So that's how early ish, but in comparison to like the OGs from the cup, like the previous bear runs, right? Um, yeah. I, I started getting really interested into this because I found no other alternative to hedge my money. 
I on see. my savings for my family. I see. And really, it was like the craziest thing that happened to me during the COVID years. I, I can, this is, doesn't even come close to managing the studio because <laughs> if you guys knew that, you know the bull run that happened for crypto, yeah. right? Yeah, the summer. And can you imagine being early in that bull oh, run? Oh, man. I, Bitcoin is nothing compared to DeFi's yeah, bull nothing. run, yeah. right? If people thought you made money in Bitcoin, guess where that money went? Into DeFi. Like yes. Everyone who cashed out in Bitcoin went somewhere else. Um, so I saw the moons of DeFi, but I also saw the dumps of DeFi. And I think it's a fair say that, you know, if you made money in DeFi, good on you. You earned it, keep it, you know. But if you lost money in DeFi and you're just one of the millions who, who do it every day, right? And and that's my involvement in crypto. I've been I've had a very separate life. Uh, I still keep it very low because in the blockchain, if you find my wallet, you find everything that I have, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm a I'm a proud owner of NFTs that I keep to myself. I'm not a flex at all because I'm part of that circle where I hate people who shill stuff. Oh right? yeah. If you buy a coin and you're an influencer, you shill then you dump on people. I hate I hate things like that, right? Mm, mm, mm. And I will never share coins that I'm buying because I want you guys to buy it or something. Um, but I know got my own peers who are doing it, so you know, screw them. Uh, <laughs> I, I have very real talks with them as well. Like, hey, dude, Doge is just Doge. Don't, it's not. It's not Bitcoin. It will, yeah. it will never be Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> but you still have people who are believing, like, oh, Doge to the moon. I'm like, if the moon is upside down, yes, hundred percent, right? Um, but that's just me. I know Doge army is going to come after me for this. But uh, <laughs> that is my story in crypto, and and true crypto, I've really figured out that um, this is, this is really what money's future should be like mm. um, transparent uh, accountable and pretty much flexible to a point where banks don't take 90% of what you should be earning mm. right so that is really I, I would say that crypto's philosophies have changed my life because of the the mentality you build as a trader and, and as a risk taker um, and also the simple philosophies of trading, which is like, before you want to plan an entry, plan an exit. Mm. Know where to call it quits. Yeah. You know? So like, just managing, even like bringing that values into my daily life, what is your stop loss? What yeah. is your take profit? And it's very funny to ask yourselves that things, but it's, you apply it to relationships. How far would you go for a person before you should be saying that's enough? Yeah. You know? There's no take profit on relationships. Like, let's just put it that way. But yeah. you know, in some circumstances, the philosophy of crypto and, and trading, um, it has definitely benefited my life in, in so many ways. And through the profits of crypto, I've been able to build new communities in like Pokemon and collectibles and stuff like that, right? And it's just been a crazy ass roller coaster ride. Like, my brother called it a scam until I showed him how much I earn and he's like, I want in now. And I'm huh? like, nope, I don't think it's safe to get in now. Yeah. Uh, wow. the, but that's what everyone does. So, mm. you know. FOMO, yeah. ma, FOMO. They only yeah, see the peak. You're FOMOing in, I'm cashing out doing yeah. so. Yeah. Uh, well, would that, you say that, that that all this, whatever happened to you doing crypto was essentially the thing that helped you out a lot in that six months where directors weren't taking any Oh, no, money. no, no, no. The, this was, it was not at all, man. Yeah, it was way after. Like the way after, pandemic hit in March, right? right, March right. The, bull run, the bull run didn't happen until like the end of the year or like next January, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it definitely wasn't part of the thing that helped me sustain. Like I see. The, the clients who were coming in during COVID helped us sustain because nice, I don't nice. mix my personal finances with I the see, companies. I see. Yeah. I see. Like, uh, this was all my personal savings going into my crypto, not not like the company stuff. Uh, right, right. But but yes, it did help me personally. Yeah, understood. Um, and it also gives me a different vantage point of applying principles that I learned in DeFi into my work. Yeah. So yeah. Decentralization and all that kind of thing. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah it, is, it, is. it is. It is. It is. It is. So what are your yeah. top lessons then that you mentioned that you can transfer into your like your personal life that you've learned oh, from DeFi? Uh. Know your limits, uh, number one. I think people don't know your limits most of the time, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and like I said, like the very interesting concept of traders, successful traders, is that you always have an exit plan before yep. your entry. Yep. Before you want to take a risk on something and, and, and do it, know when you're going to take a profit from it, right? And that's very tough for me as a, like someone who runs a studio who does not want to sell my studio, oh, yeah. right? Um, so... Things like that and stuff like um, 
I, I would say never invest what you're not willing to lose, right? And that goes so far. Yep. Um, the hours of your day, uh, your sanity, uh, your patience and your hair, you know, your blood <laughs> pressure, yeah. right? Um, I think, I think it's, it's, it's all these things that really show you what success is really made out of. The, 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 the people that I look up to, um, the whales, right? Mm-hmm. The whales and the mega whales, right? They never really do the 10Xs and the 20Xs. To them, it's about 5%, 5%. 3%, mm. 2%. It's small, calculated risk, calculated profit. And that's what we don't see in our daily lives. We want to see the, 10X you know, the growth, yeah. right? We want to see the 10X, but we don't respect the day-to-day 1% that we're improving. Mm. And sometimes as a creative, that is the worst part because you want to see growth and you want to see uh, like a burst of growth. You never are satisfied with the 0.1% of growth that you're going through. But if anything, ask any crypto trader and they will be like, we prefer boring growth. We prefer Mm. the safe and steady. And it's the anxiety and the sweat and the cold sweat all comes in when you know you've risked something more than that. Mm. So yeah, I think those were like very, very great lessons that I learned in crypto that the successful people are the most patient people not the other way around. Mm. Um, and they're never gambling. They are mm. never gambling anything. And, and, and compared to popular belief, lah, right, that the trading market is a gamble, like these guys have risk management down to the T. And I admire that a lot. Mm. So wow. just some of the lessons, some of the lessons in crypto. Other than that, it's just to the moon, everything to the moon. You got to be a degen, right? So mm-hmm. uh, time, yeah, we. I love the whole mindset of invest in something and make sure it blows up a hundred thousand percent unrealistically blow up. So that, that is just, it's, it's like a, it's like a, like a stupid meme of crypto that I absolutely love as well. But Hey, it's the wild west there. That's really the wild west. Uh, and that's crypto for me. La. Again, not financial advice. Please yep. don't do this. Uh, anyone listening it is not safe. It is, 100% not a safe place to go. <laughs> uh, your own risk, your own risk, guys. So I don't know how you're going to answer this next question, but uh, you know, okay. you mentioned you started with Pancake and that's the the BSC, right? Binance Smart Chain. Yes, Binance. Area. Yeah. Are there other chains that you you participated in that <laughs> you, you quite enjoy or you've just been, you know, uh, sticking in the BSC? So I, I committed to BSC for almost a year. Um, and I have been looking around like Polygon and I think Phantom Chain or Solana Chain and a few random ones, right? But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter where you're going on the chain. It matters where people are going. Um, and and it just makes sense to stay in Binance for now because that's where most of the volumes are. Yep. And you need volume to make money. You know, you, you if you go to Solana and a project is there and they're promise, promising you 100x, but not enough people are investing into it. There's really no use. Um, but again, there are strategies that like if I, I, I hear there's a project coming up for a white listing, mm-hmm. sure, I'll, I'll skip over for a while. I'll put some down. I'll wait for like a 5X moon and I'll get out and I go away to BSC. Uh, there's no problem with that, right? Mm. But yeah, the home, home is BSC. Uh, I see. They're doing really good work. Uh, some people hate it because it's centralized, but mm-hmm. I think we need a balance. You can't run from that, right? Yeah. You need to cash out somewhere, right? So um, that's that's pretty much it. But hey, KL cannot cash out properly. Uh, just saying first, not financial yep, advice. Yep. Okay? <laughs> yeah, we, have to, yeah. we have to do it through uh, through Mr. Luno, right? Yeah. We, we have a common friend. I'm, I'm sure you know him, uh, Ross Stevenson, the guy with the big oh, yeah, afro. Yeah. afro yeah. I, I saw his whole journey into crypto, man. Ooh. Like I, I was witness to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. we always like to joke, you know, Luno is the, 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 the money laundering platform to, to wash the money. <laughs> <from>. Oh, <laughs> there you go. I love it. Yeah. This is why it's I love non-sponsored they, they, episodes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So, uh, yeah, any, any more questions? Uh, Probably just one last one on... on uh, um, um, your philosophy to probably investing. I, I mean, oh. I, you did you did give some glimmer of it when you were talking about the trading. What do the whales do, whatever. But mm. in terms of um, building wealth 
and creating mm. wealth and in investing in general and transcending generational wealth. Um, have you thought about it or is it yeah. something that you you feel that? Oh. Yeah, and it's, it's related because, it, it, I mean, as parents, how do you transfer man, money values or money culture to your children? And it, I, I feel mm. it boils down to a lot of what you think about and how you reflect about generational wealth. Uh. I know yeah. it's a bit, a bit, a bit philosophical, but hey, yeah. you're a psych yeah. major, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, this was like the questions I need to answer for my paper. So, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm a bit torn here, right? Because as a dad, you want to provide for your family, um, but as a responsible human being, you don't want to spoil your family, right? Mm, mm-hmm, I don't want to mm-hmm. spoil my kids' approach to money in the future. Um, I, I, I remember watching Steve Harvey. I love that dude. Like, he's an entertainer, and as a uh, uh, running like running his home, he told his kids that you know when I die, I'm probably gonna leave you five percent of what I own. Mm. <laughs> which is quite and a lot you, to be fair, but okay. Which is still quite a lot, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Five percent, and your mom and I we're gonna spend ninety five percent of everything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I I do agree with that to a certain degree. Um, I I do believe generational wealth can be made, um, uh, but I also need to make sure that my kid is, uh has the ability to run that wealth, mm. not just spend it, mm. right? Mm. And and I, I and unfortunately, we, we are in this world where there's that cycle. Uh, um, our grandparents had it super hard. Yeah. That's why our parents worked so hard. Yeah. And because our parents worked so hard, they created a good life for us. And because we do know a level of comfort, we will never work as hard as our parents yeah. and our grandparents. Precisely. Right? So I got to break that cycle somehow. And... Uh, and, 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 and at least one of the simple things that my mom has passed to me is no matter how little they have, they spend normal. Mm. No matter how much came in, they, they spend still no- spend normal. That's right. And I think that's the values for me lah, in terms of uh, generational wealth, right? Understood. Like this is, my house is the way it is because I really had nothing to spend on before <laughs> I got married. <laughs> so... Uh, when my wife came in and I say like, does this make you happy designing your own house? Then she said, yes. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. Like within reason, right? Mm. We don't have a koi pond like on our, our balcony or something like that, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, I, my, my values of family and generational wealth is, is that like, I don't want my kid to be spoiled. So you're going to earn your own money. I'll be there for you to, to, to make sure you don't die. <laughs> but you got to learn how to make your own money, mm. yeah. right? My money is my money. I'm gonna put you through college, which is the last responsibility I'm gonna do. Yeah. And then you're gonna make it on your own, right? Yeah. Um, but I think as a as an investor, um, there's two main rules uh, that I think crypto taught me the most. Mm. Obviously, don't invest what you can't lose. Yeah. It's not savings. Yeah. First and foremost, right? And second one is there's no such thing as risk. It's only uneducated attempts. Oh, very good. That's really it. Very I don't good. believe in risk. Like I don't believe like. People saying, oh, that's too high risk. Crypto is too high risk. I always tell people, no, you know what's high risk? High risk is eating at the Rojak man beside the Longkang and you don't know whether he's <laughs> washed his hands. Yeah. Okay? That's risk, bro. And we gladly take that risk as Malaysians every yeah. day, dude. You know? Risk is just something you don't know about. And I know crypto. So crypto is not risky to me. Funds and stocks is, ris- is risky to me because I know nothing about them, right? Mm. So... That is really one of the philosophies that crypto has taught me. If you know what you're doing and, and contrary to popular belief, in the blockchain, you have the ability to know everything you're doing. Yeah, correct. In funds and stocks, the banks and companies hide a lot of stuff from you that you will never know. Yeah. Um, and that's why people choose DeFi sometimes, right? Yeah. Um, but that's my philosophy. I, I think risk only is present if... if uh, knowledge is absent and that's it that is the main philosophy of crypto for me la. so if you want to make money know what's happening before you try that's that that's basically it just fun yeah. fact for you ming han and uh, i'm going to get mj to verify whether i say it's uh, it's correct yeah. <laughs> do you know no in finance schools do you know uh. in finance schools and investing schools risk to them is volatility yeah and it's taught in finance schools i kid you not and volatility that's so weird because volatility, volatility is how you make money bro yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah you yeah. see you see what i mean yeah. and this is taught in finance yeah. schools uh. <laughs> oh but but okay la, i i do understand that perspective yeah i do understand the perspective because 
finance schools teach you that also, you know, the boring ways to make money is the best way to make money. Yeah. So you want something that's like the least volatile, right? Yeah. But as a Wild West degen sculptor, you need volatility <laughs> or you're not going to make money. 100%. Right? Yeah. I need that pump to from 10 cents to one buck to do something, dude. I can't be like, one buck, one buck, one buck, one buck. I'm like, I'm not going to do anything with that, right? 100%. So yeah. Yeah, it yeah. depends. I guess it depends where you find your dinner. So, yeah. Exactly. And I mean, even true, true blue value investors that MJ and I follow, for them, risk is permanent loss of capital. And permanent loss of capital comes from not understanding what you're buying into, which is. Oh, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone yeah. who's buying Doge. Sorry, yeah. but yes. <laughs> I think I know who you're talking about. Uh, the person even started. What the heck, you. man? Doge to the moon. Doge to the moon. Dude, you never even read the Doge contract before. What, what moon you're talking about? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know? So I'm yeah. sorry. I'm just, I, just, just saying everything I'm saying to you guys, I willingly say it to the, the people involved, like to yeah, their face. Yeah, it is good. Like, it's literally. good. I mean, in, in our podcast, yeah. we want to be as transparent yeah, as possible. Man. Yeah, yeah. Man. Maybe we yeah. need to be on some Doge investors. Like, oh. to, <laughs> no, no, we need to yeah. balance the views a Do- little bit. Dodge investors, you have to the Bitcoin, Shiba boys, Shiba boys, the Bitcoin maxis, the Bitcoin, yeah, yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. But uh, again, everything's driven by sentiment. So if you did well, good job. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, mm-hmm. last two questions. They're they're not. Uh, so the first one is linked to money, and then the last question is just a fun question for me. Uh, <clears throat> what is the what is made made it money for you? Meaning like. Yeah. Like, so, so I asked this question to mm. my friends. They, they, some, some of them give a specific number. Some of them define it by the amount of income that they would generate a month. Some of them will be as simply as, you know, I can walk into any restaurant and I don't really look at the price tag. Yeah. yeah. So what would be your definition? Yeah. yeah. What, like, yeah. Because wow. you know, in crypto, everybody is saying uh, we all going to make it, right? So, yeah. Yeah, crypto is the worst place to ask whether people made it or not. <laughs> <laughs> like it's never enough in crypto, seriously, yeah. right? Uh, but then again, it's never enough in, in money in most of the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess made it money for me is when I don't need to worry about my family's health. Mm. I think that one is the most important. Because uh, okay. money never matters to anyone until you really need it, yeah. right? Uh, it never matters when you have a lot and you can splurge. Yeah. Um, so I think in, in terms of that, because I, I've always... You know, even with the upbringing that I had, one of the things I highly disagreed with is like money can never make you happy. I I think that's Mm. a really stupid statement. Oh, yeah. Money can make you very happy. Yeah. Right? But money will never make you fulfilled. That's the difference, right? Like money will make you happy. You can pay a hospital bill. Oh, so happy, man. You see, you cannot make... uh, If you can't pay a hospital bill, you see how happy you will be, right? (laughs) Um, But but that's that's, that's the thing. I think to me, like the make it money is less of uh, menus and, and and picking up stuff in, in shops, but more of like telling your parents and your family like, hey, don't worry, if anything happens, we're good. Yeah. We're we're good. To me, that's really make it money. I understand. Like, we good. Don't worry. You know, you tomorrow lose two legs, you're good. Don't worry. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that's make it money. It, it's okay. less about because I mean material stuff, I think I think honestly, la, if as a human being, right, if we really put our minds to it, we can really do a lot of things on, right? Yeah. Just how long it will take to do it. Yeah. So if you want to make it, you can. Just, you got to dedicate, lah, you know. You got to commit, find a way to do it, fail, try again until, unfortunately, some people never get there. Lah, so, but you can put your mind to it, right? Um, but so it's less about achieving a certain number. It's less about achieving a certain purchase. But I think it's about maintaining a, a good life mm. to me lah, without care or worry per Understood. se. Yeah, that's make it money because I think for me, I value peace in my life the most uh, and, and, and sustainability. So yeah. I rather have like one guitar compared to like six. <laughs> I can maintain one guitar very well. This has made it to me, you know? <laughs> um, again, I'm the worst materialistic guy you can think about. I can give you a few friends who are like really made it money, kind of uh, made it money, right? Yeah. If you want. Um, but yeah, that, that's that's my definition. That's my definition. Yeah. Mm. Okay, question. any... any No, last any one. Question? Okay, this is a fun question. But you know, wh- one of the... You know when your when uh, when your brother Ming Yu started creating those short series, uh, yeah, the real they, they were so good, right? And uh, and and I think the most memorable one was about uh, uh, the 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 one about PJ people and uh, there was a skit. Uh, then mm. they're talking to Clang people and all that. Yeah, so yeah. So yeah, is is PJ the best? I have to ask you. <laughs> Where are you from? 
I'm from PJ. So yeah, bias, guess, bias, bias. Oh bias. yeah, PJ is the best, hands yes, down. 100%. Okay, good. That's all, that's all, There's that's no all question I'm about this. No question, you get so. anyone, everyone who has everyone. moved to PJ from Subang, Klang, they've all changed their mind. So it's just a matter of time, but we cannot import everyone. So you guys just yeah, stay yeah. where you Sorry are. La, we, need, we, need a, we need like a visa system or something. <laughs> you know? Yeah, we need, we need the space. So stop moving to PJ, yeah. guys. Just I, stay I, where you I, are. I don't know whether this is your experience, but having lived in PJ basically 99% of my life, um, you get really bad at geography. It's only until recently that I know clients in the in the west. <laughs> oh yeah, I never cared where east, west, north, yeah. south is. So if I ask I you, okay, you west Cheras, do you know what's the direction of Cheras, probably? Yeah, that way. That's all I know, dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> see, yeah, see, yeah, great. True blue. Yeah. Because to me, it's less about where is Cheras. I'm like, why I need to go to Cheras? Come yes. to PJ lah. <laughs> yeah, what's in Cheras? It's, you know? Yeah, what's in Cheras that PJ don't have? You know what we have? Less jam. Come to oh. PJ lah. You know, go to Cheras can get stuck in the jam for 45 minutes. So, 100%, yeah. man. 100%. Yeah. Okay, we no, no, we, are, we, are, we are quite okay with Subang lah. To be fair, they're, okay. Yeah, uh, Subang is okay. They're cool lah. <laughs> Yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah, our videographers are, are rejoicing. The bang guys are from <laughs> yeah, no, no. Subang SS15 is the cool kids area one. Seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, that's where all the cool stuff is. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't mind that one. Uh, we will our adopted uh, home. Uh, let's call it. <laughs> half, okay. half already. Uh, half, yeah, half, 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 half already. Half. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, hey, thank you so much for being on the pod. I wish you were longer. I actually have so many more questions. Yeah. Especially the part about managing the the business, right? Because I know there's so many other things. No, to this, talk this, about. this, this, this uh, only warrants that we yeah. rather than uh, have a virtual thing. I really want to have a face to face. Oh yeah, I don't know whether. Yeah, let's go get some coffee, guys. I think sure when the when it's safe or if it's safe, let's just do it. I don't mind at all. I think yeah. today was just a precaution because of the rising cases. No, yeah, no, totally we fully understand. understand. We fully understand. Yeah. And 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 you know, uh, probably. I think what we we do wish for not just you but also all all the all audience, listening, yeah. yeah, that um, you know, while we are in this pandemic, we have you know struggled through two years of trying times. You know, some have been lucky, some have yeah, not been. Yeah. Uh, we mm. do wish everyone the best. Uh, I think uh, mm. uh, I mean all of us, three of us, even yeah, I think all of us, yeah, Christians. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, yeah, no, yeah, actually. <laughs> yeah, all of us, Christians. Oh yeah. So, um, but we're not all from the same denomination. I just want to put it about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. We have a few not heretics here. I didn't even know. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah I, I think what we do wish is that uh, for me personally, and I think uh, for you, Ming Han and, and, and MJ as, as entrepreneurs, is that uh, Malaysians, are re- uh, Malaysians are very resi- resilient. Uh, yeah. This will pass. We hope mm. that whatever content that you create, Ming Han, and what we create yeah. will be an inspiration for people who find, um, you know, a roadblock or a, or, mm. or, or a dead end, you know, to be... To be a better version of themselves, uh. I yeah. think that that's mm. what I wish for, uh. Same, same. I hope, yeah, hundred uh, percent. I hope I, I, all the million and one things we talk about today, at least something helps someone somewhere. That's yeah. that's the whole. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, the, that's, key, the, that's the key. That's the key. Yeah. All right, guys. For those listening, definitely this is a high value podcast. Yeah. So uh, do uh, <laughs> listen to it several times, yeah. not because we want uh, you know our, our our the the views to come in, but really because it's going to be really beneficial. And if you like this sort of content, share with your friends and uh, those on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, click on the bell for follow the, no, for those of you uh, who like like me don't know the, yeah. the the main thing. You know, do check out their channel. You see, usually we ask people like, do you want to plug? Like, where can people find you? I think with our guest today, yeah, uh, yeah. they but have been found already. They've been so, found, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, we had any any last words to sign sign off? Yeah. Um, I think I I don't want to glorify having a good life or anything in in covid but yeah i just want everyone to know like uh, entrepreneurs or not just know la, that the real success in in this two years right is yeah. just making it yeah making it through yeah. and if yeah. you've done that you are the best Pat yourself at the back yeah yeah yep yep i just because a lot of my friends the entrepreneurs take it very hard on themselves right yeah mm-hmm they still want to 10x. I'm like, 10x what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> 10x from zero. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's 10x, 10x zero is still zero, bro. You know? so, um, so yeah, I just I just thought that, you know, at the end of the day, we talked about a lot of good things and, and bad things, but I think the realistic thing is just like, if you made it through COVID, you're still here, you're still kicking, you're still trying to find a way that you still have problems, means you still have something to work on and that's yeah. great. So keep on going, you know, hang in there, really. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, I guess we'll see you in the next pod. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. See you. Thank you.